appreciate it. And commissioners, thank you for being here tonight. And so we'll start right off with uh, the adoption of the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt? And the agenda is in front of you, the latest agenda. So is there a motion to adopt agenda? There's a motion and a second. Anyone wishing, anyone wishing to make additions? All right. All those in favor of the agenda say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And now we're on to item C, which is, it says in the agenda that it's January 24th minutes, but it's actually the 10th. Um, so make note of that, and those minutes have been sent to you. And any, any questions or edits on those? So we'll need a motion to approve those minutes. There's been a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the January 10th minutes are adopted. So now we are on to item D, which is the recognition of the council members. And we um, do this as uh, we see the council members come in, and the only council person here so far is Council A. Van Reese. Would you like to speak now or uh, for the item? Okay. Thank you for coming down. It's good to see you. And um, I didn't see any other council members, so if any come in, we'll make sure that they get recognized uh, during the item. So now we are on to item E, which is items for deferral withdrawal. Lisa? We have the following items for deferral or withdrawal. Item 1A, 2018 CP 010003 on page five of your agenda, Green Hills Midtown Community Plan Amendment. The associated case, item 1B, 2018 SP 077001, the novel Edge Hill SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 14th Planning Commission meeting. And I will note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from both 1A and 1B. Item number three, 2015 SP 019003, 121 Lucille Street SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 14th Planning Commission meeting. Item number four, 2018 SP 074001, the 3049 Earhart SP. Uh, staff recommendation is to defer to the February 28th Planning Commission meeting. Item number six, 2018S110001 on page six of your agenda. The Snyder one lot subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 28th planning commission meeting. Item number eight, 2018S204001, the Hunters Run subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 14th planning commission meeting. Item number nine, 2018S210001 on page seven of your agenda. The Mosswood Lot 57 subdivision amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 14th planning commission meeting. Item number 13, 2018Z0668PR001. A request to rezone to RM20A. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 28th planning commission meeting. Item number 16, 2018Z129PR001 on page eight of your agenda. A request to rezone to MUL. A staff recommendation is to defer to the February 14th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 19, 2018CP001 on page nine of your agenda. Jolton Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 28th Planning Commission meeting. Item 21, 2018 SP 084001, the West Trinity Lane SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 14th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 22, 2019 SP 006001, the Third Avenue North SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 14th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 27, on page 10 of your agenda, 2019Z008PR001, a request to rezone to RM15A on Ashland City Highway. 
Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 14th, 2019 Planning Commission meeting. Item number 29, 2019Z017PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. And item number 30, 2019Z020PR001 on page 11 of your agenda. Staff recommendation is to de defer indefinitely. That's all. Thank you, Lisa. And so, commissioners, let's make sure that, that we get these right. So, Lisa, um, the items for deferral withdrawal are, and I'll read these back to make sure that we have the correct list. So, the items are 1A, 1B, 3, 4, 6, 8, 9, 13, 16, 19, 21, 22, 27, 29, and 30. Is that correct. correct? Yes. All right, commissioners, you heard those items for deferral withdrawal. Is there a motion? There's a motion and a second. Any questions? Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and those items are deferred. Now we are on to item F of the agenda, which is the consent agenda. Lisa, you recognize. As information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To assure, ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. As a notice to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. The following items are on the consent agenda. Item two, 2014 SP 072003 on page five of your agenda, 19th and Broadway mixed use development amendment, a request to amend a specific plan on properties located on Broadway Avenue and 19th Avenue South to permit a mixed use development with a maximum of 355 multifamily units, Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions, including a condition that the ratios outlined in the original SB approval be met with the amendment. Item number five, 2019 SP 004001 on page six of your agenda, the Bate Avenue Residences SP, a request to rezone from R8 to SP zoning for property located on 12th Avenue South to permit 10 multifamily residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 10, 2019 S015007 on page seven of your agenda, the McKinnis property. It's a request for final approval to create four lots on property located on Antioch Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 12, on page seven, 2017 UD 005002, 100 Spring Street. It's a request to modify the standards of the River North Urban Design Overlay for a property located on Spring Street to modify the maximum Florida height and glazing requirements. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 17, 2019Z002TX001 on page eight of your agenda. It's a request to amend the zoning code in regards to conditions for uses of automobile sales used and automobile repair to restrict building within the floodplain, floodway, and any associated buffer. Staff recommendation is to approve with a substitute. Item 18, 2019Z003TX001. It's a request to amend the zoning code to add a definition of permanently reside. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 20, 2018SP082001 on page nine of your agenda. The Village West SP. It's a request to rezone from R8 to SP for properties located on West Trinity Lane, Young's Lane and um, west of Old Buena Vista Road. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 23, 2019 SP 008001. It's the 311 Gatewood Avenue SP. 
It's a request to rezone from RS5 to SP for property located at 311 Gatewood to permit a detached accessory dwelling unit. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item 24, 48, uh, 4387P003 on page, I'm sorry, Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from item 23. Item 24, 4387P-003, on page 10 of your agenda, the Oakwood Commons revision. It's a request to revise a portion of a planned unit development on Lebanon Pike to create three lots. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 25, 93P-004002, 14896 Old Hickory Boulevard, revision and final. It's a request for a revision and final um, site plan approval for a planned unit development on property located at 14896 Old Hickory Boulevard. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 26, 2019Z005PR001 on page 10. A request to rezone from RS5 to R6 zoning for property located at 1603 Luton Street. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item 28, 2019Z015PR001. A request to rezone from IR to MULA zoning for property located at 820 South 5th Street. Staff recommendation is to approve. Under other business on page 11, item number 31, a contract amendment for Creamy Sharp. Item number 32, a contract renewal for Deborah Sullivan. Item number 33, certification of bonus height compliance within the DTC for 1222 Demumbrian development. Item number 34, certificate of bonus height compliance within the DTC for 1125 10th Avenue North development, and item number 38 to accept the director's report and approve administrative items. Thank you, Lisa. And so commissioners and Lisa, make sure that these are the correct items that are on the consent agenda. And those are items number two, five, 10, 12, 17, 18, 20, 23, 24, 25, 26, 28, 31, 32, 33, 34, and 38. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, commissioners, you've heard those items for the consent agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the consent? It's been a motion and a second. Any discussion? Saying none. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the consent agenda is adopted. Thank you, Lisa. And I did see Councilman Sledge. You you want to wait on your? You're good. Thank you for coming down. We appreciate it. <laughs> we appreciate that too, Councilman. Thank you very much. All right. So now, so that means for that we're going to actually hear for public hearing items. I want to make sure I get this correct as well. Item seven, eleven. 14 and 15. So we have four items to hear tonight. And so what that means to the public is that if you're not here for one of those 14 items, your, your items have already been taken care of. They're either deferred or have been passed. So let's go ahead and get started. Item seven. Item seven is a request for concept plan approval and a variance from the subdivision regulations for properties outlined in red located in the Cane Ridge area. Keep in mind that this is a subdivision and it's not a zone change. No additional entitlements are being requested. Staff is recommending approval with conditions, including approval of the variance. The site is approximately 104 acres in size. It's on the west side of Cane Ridge Road and it's adjacent to Old Hickory Hills to the west. The property contains dense forests, hills, and there are also possibly sinkholes on the site. The property is owned RS10. This requires a minimum 10,000 square foot lot and would permit up to a maximum of 453 single family lots. This is the proposed site plan. It calls for 269 single family cluster lots. The cluster lot subdivision requirement is intended to promote active and passive open space um, as well as preserve sensitive environmental features, such as hills, streams, and sinkholes that may be located on this site. 
Uh, to do that, the cluster lot option permits lots to be reduced in size from what would be required under the normal zoning. In this case, lots have been reduced to 5,000 square feet. As shown on the plan, lots range in size from 5,200 square feet to 11,000 square feet. The plan provides 46 acres of open space, including 2.7 acres of active, which includes walking trails and amenity areas. Access into the site is from Cane Ridge Road to the east and Ramstone Way to the west, encircled in red. The plan also provides for future street connections that are circled in red to the north, the west, and the south. The major and collector street plan calls for a future residential collector within this area. As proposed, the plan provides the collector that runs from east to west and will eventually connect Cane, connect Cane Ridge Road to the unbuilt specific plan to the west. The subdivision regulations require some form of shared access along arterial and collector streets, and this would apply to the proposed collector street. The applicant has requested a variance to this section stating that the topographical conditions make the shared drives infeasible. Now keep in mind that this site does have uh, lots of hillsides, and the applicant has indicated that homes will be at different elevations stepping up and down the hill, which makes the drives difficult. The commission can grant a variance if it finds that a hardship results from strict compliance of these regulations. Findings should be based on that the variance will not be detrimental to public safety, health, or welfare. The condition with the variance is based on unique conditions to the site. The hardship is a result of physical surrounding shape, topographical, or other constraints, and the variance is not inconsistent with the general plan. Staff finds that the request meets the minimum criteria for granting the variance, as a variance will not impact public safety, health, or welfare. The specific site conditions are unique to the site. The hardship is based on the topography of the site, and the variance does not conflict with the general plan. Inclusion staff is recommending approval with conditions, including approval of the variance, as a plan is consistent with cluster lot options, and the variance meets the criteria for granting it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. We'll open this item for public hearing, and is the applicant in the room? Come on up, welcome. Uh, you have 10 minutes, and you can save two minutes of the 10 for rebuttal. Thank you for coming. Please thank state you, your name and your address. Yes, sir, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Council Member, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joel Tew, T-E-W. I'm an in-house land use and zoning manager for Draypack Capital Partners, which is the owner of Cane Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, LLC, which is the property owner. Um, Mr. Max Cooks, who is a principal with Draypac, uh, is here with me. And our local consultant, Mr. Roy Dell, is our planner. He's also here for any technical questions. Uh, we're based in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, is the U.S. office. It's an Australian real estate investment firm, but has a substantial uh, office in Atlanta and substantial U.S. holdings. Um, we obviously concur with the staff recommendation, and I'm just going to make four or five very brief points, and then I would like to reserve my two minutes for rebuttal uh, to any public comments. Um, as was pointed out, this is a subdivision approval, which of course is very important. important. This property already is zoned. We have RS10 zoning, which in fact allows 3.7 unit per acre max, which on this site, per the staff report, would allow us to actually plan up to 453 units. Our revised concept plan, based upon the modification since we acquired the property, are only for 269 units. So again, only 269 units are being proposed out of the 453 maximum that the existing zoning category would allow. Hence, we're only proposing development at 60% of the allowable density. Um, in addition, the RS10 category, of course, requires 15% green space. Our plan, as the staff report reflects, actually provides for 45% green space. We, in fact, are providing 300% of the green space requirement, and, of course, the favorable cluster design is what is enabling us to do that. In this case, uh, this project really is the poster child for why poster uh, for why cluster design generally is a good idea in that it's allowing us to accomplish reasonable density, again, only 60%, but at least reasonable density, and yet preserve much more green space. And in particular on this site, it allows us to avoid all impacts to any environmental features. By doing this, we gave up lots, but we avoid any issues with impacting environmental features on the property. 
And also the final result of that cluster plan and all this green space, when you look at that overall concept plan, is you truly do create a park-like setting. We're gonna have tremendous open spaces. We're gonna have an interconnected trail system and pedestrian system. It's a heavily treed property and leaving all this green space will allow us to preserve the vast majority of that tree canopy, hence the name Parks of Cane Ridge. I know developers are apt to come up with names that don't necessarily appear to fit, but in this case, I actually believe that Parks of Cane Ridge is a fair fair nomenclature for, for the appearance that this project uh, will achieve. Um, in addition, in virtually every area, if you look at that plan, our uh, perimeter buffer plan substantially by multiples exceeds the minimum buffer requirement for the zoning district because most of these large green spaces are around the perimeter in many cases and provide substantial tree canopy and buffer from any surrounding property. My final point that I want to make before reserving the time to respond to any specific comments is that uh, we were, of course, required to do a traffic impact study, uh, even though it's an update to a previously approved plan. Th this subdivision was approved previously for a lot more units than we're proposing. So ours is simply a revised concept plan to actually decrease the density and have more, we think, a more appealing, more marketable park-like uh, project to compete in the marketplace. But we still were required to do an updated traffic impact study that accounted for all of our project-generated impacts, even at this lesser number. Uh, your staff reviewed and accepted that and came back to us with their proposed traffic mitigation requirements. And there were three of them. They required um, an off-site mitigation payment amount that would go into a pool of funds from other area developments for some off-site improvements that staff feels would be prudent for Cane Ridge Road. And we're happy to contribute and pay our fair share to that as recommended by staff. They also required us to make this east-west connection over to Cane Ridge Road, which is on your adopted long-range transportation plan. Now, interesting, when we purchased the property, which had been previously zoned, previously approved with a subdivision plan, the, the land does not adjoin Cane Ridge Road. So we did not abut, and this was not a requirement of the prior approvals. However, in this case, we got early feedback from staff that they really would like to see that connection made if possible. So we have spent several months at staff's request, uh, and we actually have expended over $150,000 as I stand here already acquiring property uh, right away and easement rights from the Brewer parcel, which is where the main parcel goes. And then as late as this past month, we determined that we had to have more land south of that from the Clark parcel to actually accommodate the northbound left turn lane that we're required to install. So in essence, we, we have made that connection that's on your long range transportation plan as requested to us. We've acquired additional properties outside our project to do so. And lastly, we are in agreement with those Cane Ridge access improvements uh, and we have to build and pay for those. Uh, and we now have acquired the right of way and the easement rights that will allow us to do that. Uh, so with that said, we certainly uh, concur with and accept all of the staff's recommendations. Uh, we have no problem with any of them and we would greatly appreciate your approval. Uh, we drove up from Atlanta today and we would love to go home with our project approved because we are ready to go to market. We wanna get one or more good builders lined up and we wanna get this project started. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Dale. I'm Roy Dale, and I'll see if I can add about a minute. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned, this, they actually started working on this project well over a year ago. Uh, because of the topography and environmental features, they've spent a lot of money, a lot of time. They met with uh, Metro Public Works in order to make sure that major thoroughfare plan was adhered to. They've acquired property in order to make that happen. And uh, I want to make sure you also knew that we did have a community meeting. We, we had a community meeting, and the plans were somewhat revised based upon that. I think all the comments that were obtained at that meeting have been incorporated into this plan. So it is a plan that's been reviewed by all the agencies of Metro. All the agencies of Metro. It has been recommended approval by the staff and all the different agencies of Metro, and it is a subdivision, and they've met the perfunctory requirements of a subdivision. And we have also had a community meeting. Thank you. We'll reserve two minutes. Thank you, sir. Thank two you. minutes. You have two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, sir. Anyone wishing to speak in support? We'll make sure. 
Seeing no one, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up, you have two minutes, and please state your name. Hi, um, my name is Twana Chick. I, lived at, I live at 5967 Cane Ridge. I'm requesting five minutes because I'm speaking on behalf of the community that's represented there uh, with whom we've had the community meeting. Uh, and I want to start you. off by saying thank you to Max and Roy uh, very much for having the meetings. As a result of these meetings, uh, we in the community came up with several things and we've learned the hard way that we need to get things in writing and on the record and that's part of the reason for being here today. Part of the things that residents of Cane Ridge came up with is that we recognize the importance of resources within our community and we strive to re re uh, protect these resources for the benefit, health and enjoyment of current and future residents. Re resources that influence our community include but are not limited to the natural environment historical features, historical peoples, healthy environment, rural character, and rural character is really hard to define, but we have some of the last in Davidson County. Uh, Cane Ridge residents recognize that the protection of these resources not only benefits long-term current residents, but also future residents. We recognize that the protection of these resources also satisfies the goals of many other mission objectives, such as the goals of the Mayor's Office for Healthy uh, Nashville Leadership Council, the Governor's Foundation for Health and Wellness, the Nashville Next Plan for Creating Healthy Neighborhoods, and several other recognized national, state, and local initiatives. Our meetings with the developer have helped us meet a lot of these, and we recognize that we've already lost some other Cane Ridge resources. That's why we're trying really hard to protect these. The time to protect them is now. Therefore. The Cane Ridge Community Club members and the Cane Ridge residents demand attention to these resources when beginning collaboration and considering the lending of support to developmental endeavors. Residents of Cane Ridge have been in discussion through the holiday period and continuing with DRAPAC developers. And as a result of these meetings uh, and several meetings that we've had just with residents and one another, we offer this update and request these actions. DRAPAC has asserted a willingness to work with Cane Ridge to develop protections for the community that should include the trails and the pathways connecting neighborhoods to existing and planned greenways and parks. We'd like to have all of this designed and, and in writing before everything has a final blessing from you. Um, they were not aware of several cemeteries that are affected by the development. Metro Historical Commission has now seen those cemeteries and may have completed that process to notify every one of those, but requ we request action to show that those cemeteries are being adequately identified and like the Briley Cemetery is much larger than what was known, so we'd like that, um, make sure that's protected as well. Uh, DRAPAC is seeking due to the requirement of Metro um, the uh, easement at 5905 Cane Ridge Road, and we oppose that. That will bring to five the number of arterials that go to one connector street, which is gonna further complicate our traffic situation. Residents of Cane Ridge have been promised by Metro agencies and council members and developments in the past, developers in the past, that Cane Ridge Road between Old Franklin and Old Hickory Boulevard would remain rural by policy. The requirement of this new entry at 5905 is in opposition to that stated plan and policy, and Cane Ridge Road as it exists today will not support our additional arterial traffic. Yet, if Cane Ridge Road is further improved, then the heart of Cane Ridge uh, is destroyed and policy and promises are ignored. We residents continue to demand that our rural heart not be swallowed up and lost forever. The rural areas of our county are as vital uh, to, the, to Nashville uh, as is Fifth and Broad. We believe the requirement of an additional connector at 5905 should be removed. We don't want that connection on Cane Ridge Road. But if that easement road is required, our residents are very willing to be part of a smart design that takes into account not just a uh, dray pack, but also Evergreen that's gonna eventually connect to it and Provident Builders, which will also connect to it, and two others to the north of that that aren't figured into this anywhere. The Planning Commission shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there's more than one developer in the works that's gonna affect our neighborhood. We request a traffic design meeting with all of those developers to figure this out before we move forward just approving one at a time. The large cemetery known as the Briley Cemetery is larger than allowed for in the plan. We would like action taken to identify those boundaries and get that in writing. 
The community wants the streets within the, build, the development to have some sort of built-in traffic calming, whether it be offsets or roundabouts, because it is gonna create a straight shot from Old Digger Boulevard, Bell Road, from the Brentwood traffic going all the way to Murfreesboro. Um, they've advised that that may be too expensive and maybe not feasible. We would like that to be looked at again. And regardless of the connection to Cane Ridge Road, we request some kind of built-in traffic mitigation. The developer has agreed to develop in such a way as to respect the community and we're working on a plan that will pay homage to that, that involves markers and green spaces. We want some action to get that plan developed. Thank you, ma'am. Is that five or was that two? No, okay. <laughs> no, that was five. Um, we really appreciate you coming down. And then um, if you have prepared comments, we can put it on the record if you have okay. a letter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, two minute rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Joel, too, again, for the property owner. Mr. Dale's gonna assist me on any details. Just uh, two or three very brief points. First of all, um, as the speaker acknowledged, uh, Mr. Cooks and Mr. Dale held the community meeting and in fact, uh, there were five or six points articulated by the community club at that meeting to Mr. Cooks. Uh, he agreed to all of those points, uh, shook hands on those points, uh, was told that he would have support if he committed to those points. He came back and immediately had me prepare a written agreement reciting exactly those points and transmitted them to the community club saying, we agree, here's what we discussed, we're ready to sign this, we'll do exactly what you ask us to do. We've not received any response to that, either signed or questioned, so we did go through that process. Uh, it did include the connection of the internal trails and parks to any adjacent trailway system, where obviously we would not build an internal system if we didn't wanna give our residents the opportunity to enjoy that trail system. Uh, the cemetery condition that was alluded to, in fact, already was added by staff. That was added during our deferral period. We agreed to that, and what it says is exactly what's been asked for. The condition prohibits any construction plan approval, any site work, until any historic cemeteries are identified, they're set aside, they're preserved, they're not developed. Obviously, they won't be developed, so you already have that conditioned in the staff's recommendation, and we agree 100% with that. As to the east-west connector, we really can't control that. It's on your long-range transportation plan. We were told to add it. We went and bought two properties and spent $150,000 doing it. We're paying our proportionate share of the cash mitigation payments for this pool of funds to do exactly what's been requested, and hopefully staff will do a good job of collecting those checks from the other developers and something can be done, but we're doing what's required and we're happy to do our part, but we obviously can only do our part. Thank you, and then if there's more questions, we'll call, call Sir, you Certainly, we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. All right, seeing no one else switching to speak, we'll declare the public hearing closed, and Vice Chair, you wanna go first? So I was trying to write down the list of items that the that the speaker brought up, um, and I'm glad to hear that there has been some um, consideration of the uh, connection of the internal trails to existing greenway or to, to proposed and existing trails and greenways, um, and also that we'd address the cemetery issue. Um, yeah, I'm not ter that familiar with Cane Ridge Road. Um, I know there's a lot of development. I can see there's a lot of development potential in the area. Um, so certainly understand the speaker's concern about um, increasing traffic on Cane Ridge Road. That said, given the potential for development um, in that whole area, I don't think it makes sense to reconsider that access point because otherwise it looks like you'd only have one access point to this entire development and that does not make sense for future development as well. Um, I think this is another example of the issue we have all the time where we see a lot of development coming into an area and we have to figure out how we're gonna plan for the infrastructure needs. Um, and maybe I should defer to the council member whose district this lies in to talk about how that might be addressed. Anything else, Vice Chair? Well, the councilman, since your name was called, <laughs> would you like to respond? Thank you. Uh, 
so um, this uh, the Cambridge community is very. This is a group that has been uh, getting together for many years. It's a very uh, healthy, uh, vibrant uh, community group, and I take a lot of uh, respect um, for when they uh, organize. I wish Miss Duana could finish her uh, her uh, reading because. Uh, I think uh, I trust that that was really an expression of what the community wanted. The quandary we face ourselves is uh, part of this, um, it's really uh, something that the planning staff asked the developer to do based on the master plan for transit around the city, which I already voiced my opposition to the connectivity thing at the last meeting, and this is a good example of why I have a problem with that. It is true, Cambridge Road is a small, road that was designed for horse and buggy to navigate very uh, uh, beautiful little road, you know. But people go there uh, at 70 miles an hour and the neighbors can get out of their homes. I mean, it's, it's a really, uh, it's a test to this concept of uh, trying to uh, deal with transit better. And with the fact that now we have GPS, people will just go like uh, like water, you know, any place that water will allow them, they'll just go. So uh, there, there is a couple of things that I think we should really, uh, and I, I do have to say uh, uh, the developer and uh, Mr. Dale did reach out to me and I basically told them, you gotta go talk to them. And, and they did and they went to the meeting and they tried to work with them and so, I don't know exactly what happened. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Tuan if the, if the chair would permit to answer the, the question about the, the agreement and why didn't they sign that agreement. I'd be curious to know that. I don't know what happened with that, but at a personal level, I, I have uh, two issues that I would like some clarification. Uh, the cemetery, cemeteries are very important in the country. I mean, it's important all over the place, but when we're trying to preserve history, uh, what tends to happen with cemeteries is they get relocated, and sometimes they disappear. They just end up being part of the, the uh, flood mitigation uh, design. And, and I don't think that's a good way to show respect for the people that live there. So uh, on the conditions, uh, they, it is permitted to, to relocate the cemetery. But the developer mentioned that they will be interested in preserving the cemetery. And I think it's an important distinction that we should clarify uh, if they are going to uh, preserve the cemetery or they are going to relocate it. Well, let's, while we're on that point, let's have the director respond. That's okay. Kelly. So we, we agree with you that cemeteries are important resources, and we come across this from time to time. Um, the state has developed criteria and a process for developers to follow, and our historic staff um, know how to implement that. And basically, um, the developer will document what they what they find if, if a cemetery is is found, and then there are a series of steps. But basically, the the city will have an opportunity through the historic commission to provide guidance about what needs to happen, whether it's um, you know relocated, it remains in place and is preserved or interpreted. That's something that they'll, we'll get guidance on. But typically, at this phase, we wouldn't predetermine what the historic folks will will advise. Um, if, if that makes sense. It makes sense, but that's not what they agree with the neighbors. Uh, what they agree was what, to preserve the cemetery. And so I just wanted to clarify that. I know where you're coming from. We have, we have state rules. We cannot impose it on them. But if they mutually agree to preserve the cemetery, that will be something between them. And that's I what I wanted to. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. So you're seeking clarification as to whether or not the developer has already agreed, regardless of what the historic yes. folks say. So that's, to that's preserve one them. question. Okay. And the other question, uh, I understand that you guys, uh, well, that we mandated uh, this collector's tree, this connectivity. Uh, but I will I will wonder if we could do something to mitigate the the fact that this is going to become a highway and why can like some kind of a angle be placed into that road or, or a roundabout or some way to discourage people from picking up speed and, and using uh, this road that way so those are the two main issues that I would like to um, to uh, 
talk about and get clarification. So let's let's handle one at a time. So the question is, is the developer and and you had said that something to that effect, but yes, can we sir. get a clarification? Again, Joel, too, for the property owner developer, we, we are happy to have that condition modified to say that if if identified, if locate and identified, that we will demarket and set it off with, you know, whatever type of boundary item, historic markers, and, and leave it in place and develop around it that is prescribed. We, we have no driving desire to relocate that. Uh, we actually, we agree 100% with you and with the community that that's the preferred solution. And we've dealt with this in other locations. So we're happy to do that and, and, and give appropriate markings and, and commemorative historic marker to tell people what it is. Uh, not just, as you say, not just let it sit there. So we agree 100% with that and, and no objection to that if, uh, if you wish to modify that condition to Well, since you agree, we'll that. put it in as a condition. Sure. Councilman. That's the way to do Thank it. Then, then we have to do it no matter whether anyone signs an agreement with us or not. Put, put it in your condition. Thank you. And we concur. We can make that part of the motion. Yeah, two questions. And then the second was the traffic calming condition. Is that correct, Councilman? What is, what is your plan on that? Well, traffic? my suggestion on that, as I said, we've, we've been required to do kind of three things. We were asked to go out and acquire these properties to get the connection, which we, we've done. We've spent the money, we closed, we have them to provide that connection. And then we were asked, of course, to, uh, to pay uh, what the staff concluded was our fair proportionate share, considering all the development that is happening into this. Uh, let's call it this Cane Ridge Road Fund. So I don't know if we're the first that's been whacked with that. If so, I guess we're proud to be first. Uh, but the point is, you do have a mechanism that, that clearly the staff is of a mindset, and we agree that everyone out there who's potentially impacting this need to add to our kitty. Presumably, there will then be a core of funds, and I would think that the powers that be could analyze that roadway and what's coming and use those funds. The whole purpose of those funds is to make that road safe, uh, not to make it a four lane expressway because the community doesn't want that. They want that two lane rural road. And we, we agree, it should remain a rural road section. So my suggestion is to just be prudent between staff and, and, and you and make sure you get those other contributions and then ask your transportation staff to come up with that solution. Now, our third requirement, in addition to writing that check and buying those properties, is that for our access, we do have to design and construct that northbound left turn movement into our site so that the local residents who are driving Cane Ridge Road will not have to wait and be blocked by that left turn movement. So we just acquired that second additional property to make sure we had the right of way to expand. So in all fairness, I think we are bringing our lunch box to the table for our fair share. And I would suggest that you make sure these other developments contribute to that cash fund. It may be a roundabout, it may be some other traffic calming, uh, you know, reducing posted speed limits. I mean, there are a lot of ways to control this. So, I mean, I think that's our position, which I, I think is fair. I'm not sure that I really answered your question specifically, but I mean, I think just like the condition you put on the cemetery. Excuse me, I, I want to clarify. I, I don't think I asked the question right. Yeah. I'm not asking for you guys to do it on Cambridge Road. I'm saying as you lay out this connection, that you create a zigzag or some way. Th that's what I'm going. That's what okay. I'm going to articulate. I think a lot of the, you know, we had great community meeting. They're really good people. They put a, gave us a lot of comments that we were able to incorporate, and it made this a better plan. And, and everything that she says, it's, it's noteworthy and, and justified. So I would say that maybe there could be a condition that, because a lot of these are the details of a final plan, they're not details of a preliminary plan. And so that we would work with traffic and parking, the community on traffic calming, it's a discussion we can have. Uh, I don't know how you, you, can, you can put that in your, in your conditions, it's something we will do. Uh, but that's all you could really say because it's, it's detail and I can't really articulate detail. So uh, we'll work with the community. There's a set of funds that are set aside per lot, which could be used towards that uh, effort. And so uh, we could work with traffic calming, with the community, with staff, and with planning and the community. Hi, I'm Max Cooks. I'm a principal at TRIPAC Capital Partners. Um, in terms of addressing your question, um, council member, the road network can't be changed. 
and it's because it's been designed in a way to minimise impacts on the in environmental features. So if we could create a zigzag of the road, we would, but physically it can't be done without a huge amount of mitigation, excavation, retaining walls, which would make, which would deem the project completely unfeasible and create a lot more issues than possible. We spent a lot of time trying to determine how to do that collector road. And I had many arguments trying to steer clear from doing that collector road because that is a very expensive road to construct. But it was the direction we were told to move in in order to get staff support. So that's what we did. This road network is literally the only way it can be laid out if this project is to be developed successfully and through to the final phase. Okay, thank you. I, and just to add, I mean, we have, there are other traffic calming measures that we've done, like lower speed limit, potentially a roundabout, potentially some other things. We potentially could put in the conditions like, and we've done this before, I believe, is work with the staff on certain traffic calming condition, conditions without, you know, the zigzag is, is one of many options, Councilman, is, as you know, um, but that's a good explanation. So we appreciate y'all um, working with the staff and, and all of that. Does that, did they answer your question, Councilman? Um, well, I, I feel bad for them because they, they just did what they had to do, what we asked them to do. And so I'm, I can't really hold them accountable. And, and they really did reach out and they did try to work with the community. I just really want to ask the staff to to the try director to, is gonna, yeah. to, the, to the director to to try to discourage these lengthy roads that that don't have any brakes that only are conducive to to an increase uh, speeding through the neighborhoods. Right. No, I I agree with you. The lot and block structure is really important to create a sense of place. I do want to say that the applicant has framed this correctly. When we initially got this plan. Um, it was not connected um, in multiple places. This was a strategic site, if you look at the broader road network, to um, connecting several communities. And um, we felt that it was important um, not to sort of piecemeal the infrastructure and try to develop the road one lot at a time. Um, so they did go out and acquire the property at our request. Um, and we think that overall it improves the connectivity that our major and collector street plan has laid out in this area. Now, if there are some things that we can do um, to sort of make the road more curvilinear in our review, or to um, make sure that when we see the grading plan, they have taken every effort to, especially in this sort of center portion here, um, to create curves in the road that respond to the topography, that happens. I mean, we'll very often see concept plans where you have very straight roads, and then when you actually get the grading plan, it's a much more um, sort of curved, you know, design. Um, so I'm happy to include a condition in here that we work with staff at the grading plan level to ensure that we're respecting the topography, but also minimizing speeds through use of the traffic section and the like. But I think the applicant is correct in that it can be very difficult at this phase for us to know ex precisely how the road is going to align. And I, and I understand that. I, I just want to remind you all that uh, some of these things that rely on enforcement is really hypocritical because we really don't have the enforcement. And so then this will just create a, a, a problem in, the, in that part of the city. So. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman. I think we're on um, Commissioner. Uh, Vice Chair, did you finish? I want to. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I, you have another one more question. question. I, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen the contribution of a 250 per lot. Is that a new? No, I'd have to ask. This is a public this would be something condition. that's directly related to the traffic study that was done for this mm -hmm. lot. That's not okay. for this project. So it's directly related to improvements that are needed based on the development of this project. And so it's there's a nexus between the fee and the traffic study and what's being required. It's not something that's done for every project. It's based on the traffic study. Okay. But you can assume that other projects in the area are going to rely on 
the same background information and depending on the impacts, the scope of the project would be required to make a similar um, um, contribute. Okay, thank you. The Commissioner Tibbs. Um, no comment to add, but just for the record, I agree with uh, Commissioner Farr's assessment and I, and I was gonna ask the same thing to hear what the councilman's uh, comments were since it's his district, so I uh, have nothing further to add to that. Commissioner Blackshear. No further questions. Commissioner Bichelle. I just uh, wanted the um, answer to the councilman's question about why the neighborhood did not sign the agreement. So come come on up to the microphone. A couple of things. Number one, this started just prior to the holidays and we had that to deal with. And then when we received the, initially we did a handwritten thing that everybody signed off on. It was pretty broad. It was very similar to what I read earlier. And then when we received the final document back from them, it was very specific and it would have prohibited from me even standing here tonight and voicing any further concerns. And we were advised not to sign something that prohibited us that much, besides the fact that we were trying to come up with something that we could use to be applicable for all developers coming in. We're trying to do something very reasonable that meets everybody's needs. Um, we did have several phone calls. Uh, Daniel, is that the right name yeah, in Dan. Atlanta? What? Dan. Dan. Uh, we had very, some phone calls back and forth and communication, and we had lots of community meetings going on in the background but we're a lot of lay people trying to come together with something that is really way over our head and try to work with uh, experts that we could get with. So um, hopefully that answers. We were communicating. Thank you. Just, just to add to that point, um, we did agree to everything and it's in an agreement. However, our agreement that we made with the community was in exchange for their full support. And it sounds like that was the clause that tripped up them not signing the agreement. Thank so you. the agreement's still out there. They can sign it. As I said, it reflects exactly what we discussed. But we did that and went through that process in order to get their full support, which would Thank have excluded you. them from talking against us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Commissioner Bichelle. Um, so back Your microphone's on. Sorry. There we go. Back to the community lady. Um, do you mind coming back up again? Um, so do you, f we didn't get to hear everything that you were planning to read. Um, I, it sounds like most of the conditions that you really had been concerned about have now possibly been met. Do yes, you feel? We, and yes, we have verbal agreements with, actually the written agreements with them on all of those points. Nothing against them, but as we told them, we have also learned in the past that we need to have things on public record. That's just a hard lesson we have learned uh, through other folks. Um, our remaining big concern is the access onto Cane Ridge, how that's gonna connect with Evergreen and the other developments, and that's not on them. I mean, they're right, I get that. But we also know if it's not planned for now, we can't go back and, and plan for it later. It has to be done now. Um, so I think the big issue for us is just that access through 5905 and how that impacts things. Everything else, I think that we absolutely can continue working on. I've seen nothing to think otherwise. Okay, so I just have one more question then. Yes. Um, who, so if, if some kind of condition were to be placed on this specifically for the um, entry to Cane Ridge Road, um, who makes that decision since that's not really on their property? It's really um, a, a whole area decision, as she mentioned, about all these different developments all spilling onto these small streets. Who, how does that get done? Our director will answer. So um, just for clarification, this is the <coughs> section of the property that's the sort of southeast. Um, hopefully it's on your screen. I need a pointer so I can just show you. Lisa, can you <laughs> Well, I was, I was going to say the, the connection is. from this development to Cane Ridge is on property that this developer owns. I think that they're speaking about impacts of other developments in the area. So right. where this development is connecting to Cane Ridge, that's on property that is owned by this developer. 
So, but Lisa, for the if, if so to, to answer your question, as new developments come in, if there is some impact to this intersection, it will be determined depending on the type of project, if it's a subdivision or a rezoning, it will have another impact or traffic study if, if the traffic study is triggered. And at that time, there will be an opportunity to assess if adjustments need to be made or if the project um, is, is appropriate based on that impact. So it, this decision won't foreclose on other decisions down the road or other assessments, um, if that makes sense. Um, okay, and obviously yeah, their road is on their property, but um, my question was a little different than that. Cane Ridge Road does not belong to them, and Cane Ridge Road will be the road that will connect all these different um, developments, and so, Will there be a unifying plan for Cane Ridge Road, or will this have to be done piecemeal, one development by one development? That's what the per lot fee is that's talked about in the traffic study, is that there's a broader look that Public Works has taken, and that's what that 250 per lot goes into is for improvements to that corridor. Right, and so my question is, who does that? Who does that assessment? Who makes those decisions of that whole stretch? Is it Public Works that yes. looks at the yes. entire stretch of That's Cane correct. Ridge mm -hmm. for each of those different, um, to look at the big picture correct. rather than one development at right. a time? Right, it's Public Works. Okay, so then if we have the condition in there that I think you worded it pretty well if I remember what you said which I barely do, but it's on record. Okay. We'll um, add it to the condition we'll, when, okay. we, when we get to the motion. Then I think that we will have met all the concerns of the neighborhood. Commissioner Bichelle. Hey, Ma'am, I'm it, sorry, but we can't. Sorry. So the, the time for you to speak, we'll ask questions if, if we need to, but I'm, I'm trying to let a lot of leeway in this discussion because we want to make sure all of our answers our, our questions are answered, but we can't go in a back and forth because the public hearing has closed, okay? So I, we appreciate it. If we, if we have another question, we'll, we'll ask. Thank you. Commissioner Michelle, do you have anything else? No, I do not, thank you. Okay, and then Councilman, I'm gonna come back to you at the very end and make sure we have everything in, that, because I wanna make sure this is your project and so in your, your neighborhood, I wanna make sure we have everything answered. Is that okay? Perfect. All right. Commissioner Moore. I don't have any other questions. I just want to thank the member of the community for coming out and speaking so eloquently and um, on behalf of the rest of your community. So thank you. Commissioner Gabel. <coughs> I think everybody's covered anything I would have to say. Okay. Commissioner Sims. I always have something to say. Um, I want to, first of all, I want to, um, it's hard for me not to wear my professor's hat here, and we have a perfect case study here of how it should be done. And Ms. Chick, thank you so much for the leadership you've provided through the years of the whole Cane Ridge area. Many of us are indebted to you. And Councilman, how much you really trust your community and listen to them, that's for me just wonderful. Um, and then we have developers that I think are trying really hard Commissioner Gobble and I just got back from Australia and we fell in love with your environmental rules. <laughs> Not together. <laughs> just separate vacations. And Don't deny it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Um, and I have been so taken back by how articulate you are and how involved with the neighborhood you are. I do think we're dealing with issues that are much bigger than any one developer and that's really on primarily the council people and our own planning staff along with public works and transportation, everybody else to figure out how we began to look at this as holistically and, and in context versus each case. But I couldn't be happier in the way you responded to the community. And you know, Mr. Dale and I probably <laughs> stare at each other through meetings a lot, kind of going, now what are you gonna ask about the community? And I, I'm so, I'm actually really satisfied with the way you modeled that. And if I were teaching it, I'd make a case study out of you. So thank you. Commissioner Haynes. No comments. All right, well, um, Councilman, any <clears throat> last comment or motion? And I, I think it's clear we've got two <laughs> conditions to add but in the motion, but anything else? No, Sorry. I just really wanted to reiterate that they did, uh, although they were not necessarily required to have a meeting, they did call me, uh, Roy Dale and, uh, and the developers, looking to me with the community to get their feedback. They tried to find some kind of a compromise. Uh, 
so I, I really, I hope I was clear before that I wasn't passing judgment on the process. Uh, I do have a, I agree with the commissioner Sims that we we have more internal things to talk about, the, you know, in terms of planning and the council about how do we deal with this connectivity uh, nightmare. Uh, I mean, from my personal point of view, uh, uh, and then. Uh, I want to take the opportunity to say, uh, yes, uh, the developers are asked to contribute to this fund that uh, goes to do improvements, but, but the city also needs to make a commitment to, to fund this infrastructure because, I mean, with the, uh, the contributions developers make, we barely scratch the surface of all the deficiencies we have um, all over the city. So, again, that's really me taking responsibility, I guess, on, on the council for um, uh, needing to do a better job in funding some of these things. So Cambridge Road, uh, even with the money these people are going to contribute, it's not going to straighten out that job, build the shoulders that people need to stop when they get a flat tire. I mean, all, there is all so many things that uh, are deficient in those roads that, uh, all that to say, uh, I'm, I'm okay if, if the conditions we discuss are placed, I'll, I'm ready to vote for the legislation for the the recommendation so let's try this and, and um, the director will help me a little bit but your motion would be to approve staff's recommendation with two additional um, conditions one would be to um, an agreement not to relocate a condition to not relocate any cemeteries that they stay there where they're identified they work around those and then the second would be to work with the planning staff and public works um, and have appropriate traffic um, calming conditions on the north-south connector. Would that be the right motion, director? Yes. So that, would that, is that the motion you'd like to make, councilman? Si, por favor. Oh, si, that would be a yes, okay. So that's a motion, is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Oppose? Ayes have it, and it's adopted with those two additional Thank conditions, you. and we appreciate you coming Thank you, down. And Thank you. I wish I was in Australia myself at the, at the Australian <laughs> Open. Over there. Yeah. Do. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Now we're on to item 11. All right, item 11 is the barn at Mayo Farm. The request is a final site plan approval to permit weddings and events. The property is highlighted in red. You can see it here. This is located just west of Gibson Drive at the terminus of Cash Lane in Madison. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions. Current zoning on the site is R15, which is a one and two family residential zoning district. There are two overlays on this site. There's a neighborhood landmark overlay district and a historic landmark overlay district. Little history on this site. Um, this house on the property was constructed in 1925 and became the family home of June Carter Cash in 1952. Various performers of the Grand Old Opry frequented the home, June's mother, Maybell Carter a musical le legacy in her own right, later lived on the property. In 2016, the PUD on the property was canceled and the neighborhood landmark overlay district and the historic landmark overlay district were approved. Before you is the site plan, the neighborhood landmark development plan proposes to use the existing buildings, which are highlighted in red, um, to host weddings and events. This here is the existing barn. This is the exi existing residence. The areas highlighted in yellow are areas outside of the barn um, for guests after the reception, and then a wedding field over here highlighted also in yellow. <coughs> The applicant has indicated they will host approximately 25 to 35 wedding and events between the months of April and October of each year. 
Vehicular access to the site are the two existing access points. One coming from Cash Lane to the south, this will be for guests for the events. Parking is located just to the west. Sorry, I lost my pointer, it's right there. Vendor access will come from Gibson Drive over here. The maximum guest capacity is limited to 200 guests. So the guests will walk from that parking area to the wedding field and then back to the barn for the reception area. Both the wedding field and the outdoor reception area will be tented in the event of rain. The purpose of the neighborhood landmark overlay district is to facilitate preservation and protection of neighborhood features by permitting adaptive reuse in a way that is compatible with the existing neighborhood. This site is approximately 13 acres, which is much larger than the residential um, lots in the area. This development plan proposes to maintain the existing structures to host those weddings and events, which will generate revenue to support the preservation of the property um, versus the alternative of subdivision and redevelopment of the property. Staff finds that the application meets the criteria to approve the neighborhood landmark development plan. This site is historic and critical to the neighborhood to be maintained. The proposed plan maintains the established landscaping along the site, which maintains, I'm sorry, <clears throat> which minimizes any potential impacts to the surrounding uses. Therefore, staff recommends approval of the development plan conditioned upon council approval of the development plan. Thank you very much. We'll open this item for public hearing and then council lady, we can, you can go first or you can go last. And so we'll welcome and we appreciate you, you coming down and. Absolutely. Uh, good evening, y'all. Um, we're here again to talk about the beautification of the Northeast Corridor. Um, it's, this is a situation unique to me in uh, three and a half years of being a council member. This is the only item you've ever seen come not on consent. Um, that has happened because there are some neighbors that have shown some concerns. I'm here not to speak on behalf or against. Uh, I'm here to listen. Uh, I think it's very, been very clear to me uh, that the, uh, the idea of having uh, this area preserved back in 2016 was fully vetted. Uh, it came with my full-throated support, and I'm very proud of the fact that the way that this neighborhood stood up in 2016 to make sure that the landmark overlay in the landmark uh, historic district took place. Um, I have been uh, nothing but pleased over the last two years with the due diligence in which the owner of the property has gone to to make sure that whatever happens there in order to preserve the area is done so with as much community support and input as possible. Uh, to that regard, uh, we have uh, been able to uh, uh, kind of address any uh, concerns. And with any item that you've ever seen in front of this uh, commission, I'm sure that uh, the areas of traffic and noise in these situations are always primary and paramount. Uh, we've addressed these issues uh, wholeheartedly. Um, I will uh, go ahead and, and re-underscore that the uh, entrance to the property is off of Cash Lane, not on Gibson. Uh, the Gibson uh, entrance is reserved only for vendors. So if someone's catering, they can come in from that direction. So very minimal impact. But it also provides emergency access so that you can get in and out should there be a, an issue. So it kind of created its own ingress and egress in that regard. Uh, but otherwise, um, any guests coming to a wedding or event on this property will enter from Cash Lane. Cash Lane is right off of Due West Avenue. Um, so if you are uh, not from the Madison area and you're coming to an event there for the first time, um, uh, based on the traffic study, uh, you'll be coming in from due west to get to cash. Um, so that was the primary concern in 2016. Uh, Mr. Mayo has addressed this um, wholeheartedly, and uh, so I'm, I'm very confident with that. There are no new structures being built. 
there, I'll, I'll do that again. There are no new structures being built. Uh, whenever you see that, uh, that little square near, near the end there, when she called it a residence, it actually is a residence. Uh, Todd's family lives there. Uh, the kids play in the yard every day. <laughs> um, so there is no question in my mind that although uh, if a bride wants to have a private place to get ready or the wedding party wants to make sure that they have a place that they can straighten their tuxedos, that there's a place to do that. And so he's opening his home up for that situation. But for the most part, and for really for all the part, the guests will not enter the home. So um, at the same time, we have a situation to where you have this beautiful historic place that people even living in the area have not had access to because it's been a private residence. And so this allows the community to actually have an opportunity to have grandma's 80th birthday party or their kid's sister's wedding and be able to enjoy the area. Uh, again, I underscore all of the issues in 2016 have been addressed in this application. Uh, the reason you're seeing the application now for the final site review is because of the council's passage of an ordinance that uh, uh, allows uh, uh, the community to make sure they have one more look at exactly what it is you're going to do. So that's why we're here. Uh, you'll hear uh, folks that have some concerns. You'll hear some folks that are celebrating. I am celebrating the fact that they are both here. I want you to hear them wholeheartedly, and uh, I hope that uh, all the questions will be addressed. Um, with that, um, I'll uh, give some uh, moment to the applicant himself, and we'll proceed. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Council Lady. And just clarification is that near the parking lot, that's the main entrance, and then that's the Gibson is on the other side. But we'll give the applicants welcome. You have 10 minutes, and then right. you can reserve uh, two minutes of the 10 for rebuttal. Okay, thanks for coming. Thank you in. very much, and thanks for uh, allowing me to speak. I did write uh, some things down because I tend to ramble. Last time I was here a couple of years ago, it sort of devolved into a lot of history questions about the place, open to that, but I'm just going to read a statement tonight if that's all good. Um, I have worked for the last few years to, to honor and preserve and protect uh, the amazing history uh, of this very special property that my family and I call home. There is a lot of history in Music City, as we all know, that's being lost, and it's an honor to, to work to actually preserve, protect, and, and, and uh, celebrate uh, the very special place that I get to call home. I've worked with the Metro Historic Commission, Councilwoman Van Reese, and others uh, to protect a place that was home to four different country music Hall of Fame members across five decades. Towards that end, um, I went through the process of having the property rezoned in 2016 and early 2017 with the landmark uh, neighborhood overlay, uh, the landmark overlay and the historic overlay, and those did protect the property from ever being subdivided, and also they placed restrictions on what I can and what I can't do. In addition, I have worked with the Metro Historic Commission and the state of Tennessee to have the property placed on the National Historic Registry, as well as the uh, historic Metro marker. Uh, it's a special place, and what I really intend to do is to share the property on a limited basis with the public. While the overwhelming majority of feedback has been positive, including support from the South Madison Neighborhood Association, um, I definitely do understand the reasonable concerns from neighbors about traffic, noise, and security. We've listened to those community feedback, or to that community feedback, and the plans that we have submitted uh, to the Metro Planning Commission reflects that and addresses those concerns. So uh, happy to uh, hear everybody speak and then to uh, rebut any kind of uh, particulars on it, but I think that we did our due diligence and what I want to do is to share it. Uh, uh, weddings and events for somebody that wants to have a Tennessee barn wedding in a historic location, that's wonderful. That'll help me to protect the property. But there's also some community events and different, my kids go to school at St. Joseph's across there. I want to do a fundraiser there. There's some causes that are near and dear to my heart uh, that I'd like to do fundraisers for and just different kind of community things. So uh, we've limited the, the scope, the scale, and uh, addressed all the uh, noise, traffic, and other concerns that uh, were honestly reasonable for doing something like this. So uh, that's, uh, that's my part. Thank you, sir. Appreciate uh -huh. you coming down, and we'll reserve two minutes uh, for your rebuttal at the end, and then counsel it if you'd like to speak in the end, too. Um, so anyone wishing to speak in support? And, and come on up. It, and so this is what we'll do is um, everybody gets, per our rules, everybody gets two minutes. Um, state your name and address, and then, you know, in order for us, try not to repeat yourself and, and be concise. So we really appreciate you all coming down, and welcome. Commissioners, council members, um, thank you for being here today. 
My name is Kenneth White and I represent the South Madison Neighborhood Association. We got the uh, chance to meet with Todd over the property. Uh, the Maybell Carter home is within the area of our neighborhood association. Um, while meeting with the owner, Todd, we had a chance to discuss concerns by, brought up by some of the residents and to review the traffic impact studies of, ca of uh, traffic coming out on Cash Lane. After our meeting, we were satisfied that noise and traffic concerns are negligible and that the value is added to the neighborhood by allowing events at the home. We uh, are also aware that maintaining and preserving this important cultural landmark is a burden that we share as a neighborhood. It's not just on Todd alone, it's a resource that we all can enjoy. Allowing events at the home helps offset that cost and allows us to share the history of this property with a wider audience. With those considerations, the South Madison Neighborhood Association fully supports this measure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Come on up. Welcome. Welcome, thank you. Hi, my name is Leslie Rosenbaum, and I live at 901 Van Trees. I live about uh, two blocks away from where this venue's gonna be. I have just recently relocated from Los Angeles, where there is a lot of traffic and noise. I moved into this neighborhood because it was quiet, and if you go down Gibson, and that's where the vendor truck's gonna be, Gibson is only two lanes, one way going up and one way going down. So if there's vendor trucks there, we will not be able to pass. Cash is also one lane down and one lane up. If you come off of due west and the traffic is backed up, and if you put it in your GPS, it's gonna tell you how to go around it. I know because I lived with the traffic in Los Angeles. I'm concerned about the noise. It's a quiet neighborhood. We were not told until two weeks ago when we met with Nancy that there was a South Madison Neighborhood Association. Uh, why we weren't told about it, I don't know. They live at least a half a mile away. I found out Kenneth White was head of it and Heidi Hall who is a friend of the councilwoman, Nancy. And um, I don't know why we don't get any mail concerning this. We never heard about any of these meetings. And my biggest concern is having traffic and foreigners traveling around our neighborhood, where right now it's very quiet and nobody knows about us back there. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone wishing to else speaking in support. I'd like to speak in favor of this. Uh, I'd also like to say I appreciate y'all being here and the, the service that you do. I know that y'all could be doing a lot more things that are a lot more fun. Um, I have, uh, I live in this neighborhood. I own a house and I live in walking distance there. I go up due west every day of my life going back and forth to work. I go past Gibson Lane. I go past uh, Cash Alley. Mr. Mayo has been completely upfront from the very beginning. I know this because I was at the very first meeting held at Nazi College of Art in 2016. And I'm also someone who's very opinionated. I, I give Nancy Hale a, a whole lot. She'll tell you that. You can just ask her. But I want to tell you that I am 100% in support of this project because the, the issues that people raised in 2016, Mr. Mayo has methodically worked to address those issues. This is a project that makes Madison vibrant. Madison has been stagnant for far too long. And I just want you to know that I 100% support this. I live in walking distance. I own a home there. My address is 118 Due West. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Come on up. Welcome. Appreciate you coming down. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, commissioners. My name is Sue Havlish. I live at 1400 Neely's Bend Road. I'm not in Nancy's district. I'm in Bill Pridemore's district, but I am a Madison member. I'm a member of the community, and uh, thank you very much, by the way, echoing that. Uh, in 2003, we moved here from Indiana, and my real estate agent told me she wouldn't show me anything in Madison because it wasn't good enough. 
And uh, I'm glad I didn't listen to her because I took a drive down Neely's Bend and fell in love. I felt, I've fallen in love with Madison and the history of the place. Um, yeah, I know where Marty Stewart's fishing cottage was. I, you know, I know where Ernest Tubb had the, had the horses. It is wonderful. And yes, it has fallen off the memory map in Nashville. And this project is going to help bring back Madison and the joy of Madison. I drive by Due West every day myself. It is a beautiful neighborhood. And I'm familiar with Mr. Mayo's track record, by the way, as an event producer at Music City Roots. It's a class act all the way. If he says it's gonna be good, it's gonna be good. And a community, to borrow Bob Dylan's phrase, that is not busy being born, is being busy dying. And this is just another, this, this is a real boon to rebirthing Madison. Um, so I, I hope, I hope that, uh, that it has met all of the concerns because I think it's a huge boon to the community. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to support? Welcome. Hi, I'm Andrew McGill and I live at 118 Due West Avenue. Um, I can sit on my side porch uh, any afternoon and I can hear wonderful music from our Hispanic community in uh, Madison. I can also hear hip hop music across the street. I can hear music down the street uh, from Dee's Country Cocktail Lounge. If you haven't been there, you need to come. Um, I can walk to uh, that cocktail lounge and it has been a wonderful addition to our neighborhood. Um, our neighbors meet there. It's become almost our living room. Um, but the reason why I allude to Dee's Country Cocktail Lounge is that this property uh, takes that up to even a, another level, the one that we're discussing today. Uh, and once again, I could walk to it from my home. Um, one of the sad things about Madison is uh, seeing some of the properties that have been part of the musical history uh, go into decline. As you might know, there's a uh, recording studio that's on Dickerson right there at the end of Due West that's uh, probably uh, to a point that it might not ever be saved, and we drive by it every day. And this is an opportunity uh, where we have someone that rather than throw up his hands in uh, frustration has actually listened and try to do the right thing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Come on up. Welcome. Hi. Hello. So I'm Amy Richardson. I own <clears throat> Dee's Country Cocktail Lounge. I'm a little sick, so sorry. <laughs> Madison, for a long time, has been in decline. Our bar has presided, provided, um, it's almost like a public house for the community. It's, it's positive. It, it, brings people together, and we don't have enough at all up there. We have us, and that's it. If you're at Amquis Station, we have our farmer's market, but there's nowhere that you can go and enjoy the music history. We had a Colonel Tom Parker's house. is now a car wash. It's a car wash. And it was, that was Elvis's manager, good or bad. It was a music history, and it's gone forever. Now you can wash your car there. That's it. Todd is providing us an opportunity to host lifelong memories that you that you just you, you'll never have if you don't open this to the public um, i have a regular that talks constantly about growing up with june's kids and she's sad that she can't go back to the property because it's private so i have so many people on board that know that they have the chance now possibly hopefully to go there and experience where ring of fire was written <laughs> That's huge, it's one of the biggest songs in history of country music. Um, so I would like us to, to preserve that, open it to the public and give us an opportunity for Todd to share that. I think all of um, the issues of traffic have been uh, addressed. This guy is a family man and he's very much involved in um, bringing Madison back, back from, if you've been there, you know where we've been for a while. So 
We need this. And as a business supporter, I'm completely in favor. And not just because he's a friend, but let's bring Madison back. That's Thank all you. I got. And I'm 102 East Palestine, Amy Richardson. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on up. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, my name is Charles Harrison, uh, and I live at 901 Vantrese Road, which is six houses down from Barber Drive, where this event is supposed to be taking place. I didn't receive any mail notification of this hearing at all, at any time. Um, we are concerned for the tenants of the Maybell Senior Living Centre and how anyone can reach the conclusion that it's a good idea to put an event space right next door to it. Have the tenants or the families of those residents been notified of this hearing? We are also very concerned about the traffic overflow from the said weddings and events. A proposed exit is on Gibson Drive, which is full of speed bumps for a very specific reason. We fear the additional traffic through the neighborhood as people will look for a speedy exit from the area to access major highways and the interstate. Barbara Drive, Vantrese Road, Chadwell Drive, all roads just a block or two away from the Mayo Farm on which we can expect a lot of extra traffic. I've been a professional touring and recording musician for several decades and one who supports music completely. I don't want events, and I fear one of those events being Music City Roots, in my neighborhood. I come ho home to escape the road, music, and noise. This development, in my opinion, will mean the end of our peaceful neighborhood. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Let's get all of the supporters out of the way first, although that was in opposition. So seeing no one else in support, let's, anyone, are you in support, ma'am, or opposition? In opposition? Okay, so seeing no one else in support, we'll do opposition now. Hi, my name is Lee Lancaster, and I live on 415 Barber Drive. I'm a, home owner, a homeowner, and I live directly behind the property. Um, beginning in 2016, they began having amplified musical concerts that could be heard inside my house and my bedroom. And they would begin at 6 p.m., and they would last into midnight. Um, I respect musical history. I've lived in Nashville my entire life, um, except for the first four years. Um, and I am also a television radio major. I graduated from MTSU, and I understand what live venue concerts sound like. He, like whoever, Mr. Mayo, he owns the property, um, and the sound ordinance, the local sound ordinance ordinances say that um, plainly audible, like music should not be plainly audible from the boundary line of the nearest residentially occupied property. And so based on the local sound ordinances, that's a direct violation of that. And my fear is that I will not be able to be comfortable in my own home. And if he's having live television broadcasts at this property, in a residential neighborhood, that's gonna affect my house, my home, my sleep, and potentially my property value. So that's, I think, most people's major concern. There's a difference between people who live a mile away, a half mile away, versus someone who lives like within 500 feet or less. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Come on up, welcome. Thank you, commissioners. Um, my name is Connie Guerin, and I've resided at 409 Barber Drive with my husband and eight-year-old son since 2008. I am directly adjacent to the property, as is Ms. Lancaster. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we applaud the protection of the historic value of this property and keeping Madison alive. However, um, we are in opposition to this for a number of reasons. Um, including neighborhood safety, quality of life, and property values. Uh, the traffic study was completed with a proposed um, second entrance. Thank you for that, but we fear that uh, the public will Google um, 
the historic marker that has been placed, which is at 1020 Gibson, and you know Google will reroute you, and the nearest road is Barber Drive to reroute around that. This would increase traffic incredibly on event days, posing a safety hazard for many of the children who live on Barber Drive, not to mention additional traffic no noise. Additionally, the proposed plan based parking estimates on visitors traveling three per vehicle on average, and we believe that is a high estimate. Secondly, in the years since the Mayos have moved in, we have made numerous noise complaints to the police for ex excessive noise late in the evening from amplified music. The barn where music is proposed to be performed is open air and not equipped with soundproofing to my knowledge. We request specific guidelines to be added to limit decibel levels in line with other similar historic event venues located in close proximity to residences like Bellmead Plantation, Cheekwood, and others. That said, the distance from performance areas to residences for these venues is much greater than the few hundred feet from my back door. Um, while there is a natural tree line buffer in place between our properties and Mr. Mayo promised not to touch this area in previous public meetings, we have witnessed wide, tra wide trails being cut through this buffer, reducing the sound dampening um, nature. Um, I appreciate the self-imposed 10 p.m. curfew, but would like this rolled back to 9 p.m. Um, for school nights, Sunday through Thursday. Thank you. Appreciate you coming. Anyone else? Come on up. My name is Roger Hendrick, and I live at 921 Vantrees Road, which dead ends into Barbara, right adjacent to that property that we've been concerned about. I have lived there for over 36 years, and then in a quiet neighborhood, which I've much enjoyed. Uh, I believe it will be a disruption and a peaceful neighborhood. I'm retired. I'm concerned about what this will do to the value of my home and my lifestyle. I believe. <clears throat> proposed weekly weddings and events will change the neighborhood and that I have known to love before Mr. Mayo moved there. Given this, to, <clears throat> this has property backs to the Maybell Carter Senior's living facility as well as shares the property line with Creekside Rehabilitation and he Healing Center and the remainder of the residential neighborhood. I simply cannot see how you can <clears throat> think that this Placing the 200 people of 35 weekends a year smack dab in the middle of us is a good idea. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? We'll make sure we get to everybody. All right. Seeing no one else, we'll have a two-minute rebuttal. Thanks to everybody who spoke uh, for and against it. Uh, I do want to address a couple of things. Um, the Maybell Carter Nursing Home is the neighbor on the south, and I did meet with them uh, in 2016 and 17 before we actually came and did the overlay. Uh, the executive director of the uh, nursing homes, Jennifer Todd, uh, longtime Mad Madison resident, had her over to the place. We had lunch. She literally cried tears of joy that this was coming to Madison, and uh, that was wonderful. The Creekside folks actually uh, had them out that owned that, uh, back then, and they thought it was such a great idea, they actually wrote a letter to the Planning Commission that I'm sure is part of the record uh, endorsing uh, the project and, and that it adds value uh, to the neighborhood. So that's only two minutes, there's that piece. The piece about Music City Roots, I produce uh, a, a radio and television show called Music City Roots. Uh, I'm not moving Music City Roots to my backyard. Uh, that's on the record. Uh, that's not happening. I don't even, the first time I've even heard uh, somebody mention that publicly, but that's not it. It's going to be small weddings, a maximum of 200 people. Uh, uh, and when I say events, it's going to be small events. So the noise portion of it, uh, we're going to abide by all metro laws and codes just like anybody else would. The traffic we've uh, addressed. Uh, we have support from our, our commercial neighbors, which my property is bordered by two commercial nursing homes on each side, all in favor of it. And uh, I do understand, though, the, the, the residents that are saying, hey, uh, uh, you know, I don't want this in my backyard, essentially, is kind of what I'm hearing in terms of the negative, and uh, I can certainly understand that, but I feel that uh, the benefits of what we're doing uh, are, uh, are there, and, and there's a, you know, it's not unanimous support, uh, but it's a, it's a consensus, uh, and, and I feel like we've done our due diligence. So uh, that's, that's uh, what I have to say. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Councilor, a few last comments. Sure. Um, uh, I would like to uh, also thank all the members of the community that uh, came to speak in favor and in opposition 
uh, of this particular issue, um, some of which I haven't met yet, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, we do have uh, a number of different opportunities to still get together to make sure that it's very clear that all the terms and conditions that have been applied to this um, address all the issues that still remain. I think there's still a little bit of miscommunication that we can resolve uh, as it moves forward to the council level. So um, with that, um, this project has my uh, full support. Uh, I wanted to make sure and hear both sides before I said that, because I think it's important uh, that this public discourse take place. It's why we're all here. Um, so thank you for your continued uh, confidence um, in making sure that uh, music history uh, continues to thrive. I was particularly moved by this uh, concept um, that uh, a community not, not living is dying. And I uh, am very excited about moving forward, as we had said at the historic landmark uh, uh, presentation with uh, Mayor Briley, that Madison's Renaissance can, will, and must be based on its history. And this is a piece of that puzzle, and I appreciate uh, your historic uh, debate regarding it. And uh, thank you for your debate. Thanks so much. Thank you, Council Lady. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Mr. Haynes, you wanna go first? Sure. Um, <laughs> some cases always touch you. This one has touched me. I was born in Memorial Hospital. I grew up on Graycroft. I lived next door to Jim Reeves' widow. Uh, so Madison has a very special place. One of the opponents uh, compared this to Bellamy Plantation. I've been to many receptions there. Noise is not a problem. Uh, home values don't decrease. I think this is fabulous. I think this is an effort to revitalize the city, and so I'll, I'll support it. Commissioner Sims. I have a question. Um, if these are outdoor fields and no outdoor amplification is permitted, that doesn't feel logical to me. So the outdoor amplification, or I'm sorry, amplification would only be permitted inside of the enclosed structure, which is the barn, and so there couldn't be outdoor amplification. Um, there couldn't be outdoor amplification, so no, no amplification outside of the barn. It just feels limiting to me, but I guess if that's their, what everybody wants to live with, I just don't know how that would happen. Um, the other thing I think that I want to make sure that we're comfortable with is we had another property that was um, out Clarksville Highway where there was a lot of conditions put on noise and it ended up being a real problem. When you comply with noise ordinance, I'm not sure how much strength the Planning Commission has in ensuring that happens. Who, who's responsible for that? Lisa. Uh, sure, so the uh, Metro Noise Ordinance is a part of the Metropolitan Code of um, code of laws and it is a enforced by the police department um, through noise complaints. There are decibel levels that are uh, within the city noise ordinance and so um, it's enforced by the police. I think those answer all my questions and I think this is wonderful. I, I, my, my mother lived in Madison for many years and it does need this kind of resurrection grounded in its history. So. Well, I lived in Donaldson, so I don't know that that, <laughs> that, that helps much, but because um, we always competed with Madison. Uh, the, uh, I, I do think the uh, landmark overlay districts are um, critical to saving many of these historic structures. I've seen many of them go away because it just was no viable entity. Uh, and I think this is a very thoughtful design and makes a lot of sense to me. Commissioner Moore. Um, ditto. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. And uh, Commissioner Sims, you asked my questions about noise, so. <laughs> Councilman. I, w I was uh, hurt that some people don't think of Madison as a good place. I used to live there. I mean, that was my first home in Nashville. Loved the place. So don't let them tell you that it's not a great place. It is a great place. and. Uh, I enjoy when I go visit my friends up there, um, and uh, I'm in support of this thing, but I just wanted to uh, make that point that uh, Madison is, they say that about any oak as well, so yeah, just ignore that. Good point. Mr. Bichelle. 
Um, yeah, I had the same question about the noise ordinances. And just to um, clarify, there's a 10 p.m. curfew in this, is that correct? So, um, and that is for, and the weddings, can they be any day of the week? Is that written in? I think the staff should, can you put on the record the 10? Sure. The, um, so we don't have the 10 p.m. included as a condition, but if you all want to add that in as a condition, then you can certainly do that. Um, I think that's something that the owner has already uh, said that, that he was um, agreeing to, um, if you want to include that on the plan. In regards to the days of the week, we have simply, it's simply been limited to 35 events per year. Okay, and well, is it? Go hey, ahead. Commissioner, hold on one second. The, is that a condition at 10 o'clock, or what is your... Let, let's get this, Commissioner Bichelle, since you yeah, asked. Yeah, my, my thing sure. was whatever the uh, law is, that's what we'll abide by. That was sort of the where, you know, I'm, I'm uh, wanting to comply with whatever the, the law is. Uh, in terms of the days of the week, um, it's going to be on a Saturday uh, or a Friday or a Sunday. I live there. Right, I'm, I've got young children. Uh, you know, I also produce a show uh, called Bluegrass Underground in a Cave, and and, I, and I'm out there a lot. So I probably won't be there when the events are going on in terms of the weddings, the other community events. I will be there, but uh, I'm not going to do something on a weekend. Or I'm at a weekday because I'm like, what I'm going to do? I'm going to go home and help my kids with my homework and or their homework and make dinner when I leave here. So I'll be doing that. So uh, I mean, I don't okay. mind putting that as a condition if that's a super concern because it's not going to happen. But I'm not, you know, I don't know that I should overly uh, restrict things as well, but that's not my plan to do. So I really don't mind doing it. Same thing with the noise. Uh, uh, I want to comply uh, with the law and be a good neighbor in all, in all the, the, the ways. Then we're going to do music inside. The type of person that wants to have a barn wedding on Cash Lane where you know, uh, all the musical history has, it's probably going to be some bluegrass music and some cool music that's going to fill the air of Madison uh, uh, in the barn with a little bit of nice sounds and, and not at a decibel level that's above what it's supposed Thank to be you. and all that kind of stuff. Thank yeah. you. Right. Okay, um, yeah, I don't want to put a lot of conditions on this, um, but I would like to know what the uh, ordinance is. Does anybody know? Well, I can ask another question while y'all are looking that up. Um, just the uh, on in your presentation on the slide that we can see here, these two big buildings that we can see on the map are those are the assisted living facilities. Correct. Okay, and then um, if you pull out a little bit, just a block away, um, it looks like there are a lot of other. Are there other businesses um, just uh, on the other side of Gibson? Road, what road is that? I can't tell from the map. Is it okay? So see those buildings right there. What? What? Oh, that's a train track. Oh, I thought that was a road. I couldn't tell. Oh, okay. And what are those buildings right there? That's all commercial. It's all commercial shopping center. U.S. shopping center. Okay. And um, so this is already surrounded by businesses. And um, okay, right, now I can, that's the one I want to see, thank you. It's okay, good. Road. Yeah, okay. And um, so I have one other question. Can the historic marker be moved? I don't think that's a planning commission decision, but could it be moved over to the cash lane side? So that that one um, question about people being, accidentally directed to the Gibson Road entrance. Could that be easily corrected? Uh, let's, the council lady, do you have an answer for yeah, the marker? I, um, I actually, that, uh, that, land, that was put there by my request uh, because that's, that's the home entrance <laughs> um, historically. Uh, but we, uh, I'm, I'm curious and I will talk to Public Works um, between now and when this gets to the council level about um, a, a new address, like an additional cash lane address, so that um, the address uh, that's given to these events is a cash lane address rather than Gibson. So I can absolutely look into that. Thank you, Councilor. That, that would probably address a lot of those concerns about Gibson Lane. Um, okay, did you have a chance to look up the ordinance? So the um, Metro 
code ordinance in regards to excessive noise. Um, the DTC is not included, um, but essentially it um, includes standards for any sound amplification. Um, it's unlawful to operate or allow the operation of any sound amplification so as to create sounds that are plainly audible from nearby residents. There's not a um, timing. It's basically just mm -hmm. always there's excessive noise regulations. There's not, you can be louder before 10 p.m. It's basically that there are restrictions on noise all, always. So there's no um, end point in the evening when you can, when you need to calm down. No, you're, I mean, you're basically never supposed to have excessive noise. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> well, that's pretty restrictive. There's some, there's some standards, some different standards for construction, um, and there are some standards for when you can do construction um, that's covered by another section, but in regards to excessive noise, um, and me reading this very quickly, um, essentially there are some decibel levels that you're never supposed to exceed. Um, and so... If the people nearby on Barber Lane experienced a lot of excessive noise, what would their recourse be? They would be calling the police, the police would be coming and breaking up the party. Correct. Is that what would happen? That's, that's correct. So I would think that would be bad for business. So I have a feeling that Mr. Mayo is gonna try to keep things under control. Um, so I think that when these that when these historic sites are are designated, it's really hard to find a way for them to stay economically viable, and we we keep losing them all over the city. And I think this one is another good way to keep this one alive, and I support it. Commissioner Blackshaw. Yes, I'd like to talk a little bit more about noise um, for the applicant. So the, I understand no outdoor amplification is permitted. Um, so that means, so the wedding fields are outside, is that correct? So any music that is playing during the wedding can have no amplification with it? Why don't, why don't you come up yeah. to the microphone? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the barn is, so the, the weddings will happen outside of the barn, outside. That's where the reception is. That's where the nuptials can be and all that. Then inside the barn, the, there's a bar in there. Uh, there's this little stage in there, a tiny little stage or whatever. That's where the band and the reception would be. So the music would be inside the barn and then the, uh, uh, and the reception. And then the outside uh, there is where the actual, we've got barn tables and tents and you but know, things. But the ceremony, the ceremony would yeah, be outside. The ceremony itself. Well, some people will uh, want to have just the reception there, but if people want to have a ceremony there, there's actually just a, behind the barn, a little grove uh, of uh, clearing area where we'd set up an arch with the flower hours and we've got church pews and everything and then you'd have just the the, the simple ceremony and that could be on I mean that can be unamplified if that's I don't think anybody would hear that 200 yards yeah. away if that but was you, but I'm a, saying you can't amplify that part of the conditions right right I guess I never really thought about that but yeah no, I, I think that was Commissioner Sims point that it just didn't make any sense that a ceremony could happen outside but no when, amplification I of think the, sound. The, the amplification was more put in there into the plan to address the concerns about music right the a reception a party a band not necessarily the I haven't heard anybody say that the officiant couldn't have his uh, voice amplified like mine is now, but that was the intent of it. And that's really the first time it's come up or yeah. I thought about it that well, way. Well, I think, well, I guess two points to that. I mean, I think when it says no outdoor amplification permitted, I think it means none permitted. And for this, I mean, I understand what you're saying. If the, if the officiant is speaking, it probably is not going to cause any concern to the neighbors. But there could absolutely be music played, right, during the ceremony. I, I had horns playing during my wedding ceremony. Yeah, oh, gotcha. No. No, well, no, I think that the, the spirit of what we're trying to say is that there won't be any amplification. So, as a matter of fact, I was married at my house at the barn, had about 200 people, and we had an unamplified uh, uh, fiddle player, you know, playing in a uh, Ululean uh, pipes and a little, just unamplified as a little mood thing. Yeah. Then we had a band inside in the barn, you know, when things 
uh, progress to that stage. Yeah, uh, I think that's fine. I just, to the neighbor's point, I just want that to be understood that no outdoor amplification means no outdoor amplification, even if it's just the ceremony and it doesn't seem like it's a big deal, but if music yeah. is being played outside, then that would be prohibited to be amplified. Correct, that, that's, that's oh, yes, exactly. So, so my next question would be the indoor amplification. Uh -huh. So is the barn outfitted with any soundproofing measures? No, it's, it's a historic part of the property when we put the overlay and the landmark and all that, and I can't touch it to do anything. I put restrictions on that through the Metro Historic Commission. It's, a, it's an old barn, you know? I mean, it's not a, it's not a, uh, a soundproof soundstage or anything like that. It's a barn, you yeah. know? And, um, you know, through time, maybe I'd be open to doing some things, but it all has to go through Metro uh, uh, planning. I mean, I mean uh, Metro Historic or, uh, you know, all the, I don't even know what the channels are, but I signed off on all that. I guess I have to figure that out, you know? Yeah, so I bet that would get pretty loud then. I'm not sure what the neighbors were speaking about what they heard, if that was music coming from the barn or not, but I can't imagine that would not be pretty loud. Uh, again, bluegrass music uh, done, I mean, I, I don't- Yeah, I, don't, I mean, if it's a, I mean, we yeah. know, right, how wedding yeah. receptions go. It will be a very yeah. lively atmosphere. The music will get sure. loud, and so it will absolutely, I think, disturb the neighbor's enjoyment of their own homes. I understand that the condition says it has to comply with the noise ordinance, but I feel like right. we always have to comply with the noise ordinance. That's not that's not a unique yeah, I think I, condition. Uh, yeah, not knowing what the law uh, is and knowing that it doesn't sound like there's any clarity on the time thing, again, I, I would have no problem saying uh, the music would stop at 10 o'clock just because I think that's being a good neighbor, you know, uh, to be honest, and I'd be happy to do that and let people know that are interested and want to come and have their wedding there to share it, to say, hey, the music stops at 10 o'clock. I think that's being a good neighbor. I think that'll be a nice condition. And it sounds yeah. like you're um, anticipating, which obviously makes a lot of sense, the weddings to occur on the weekend. So, but if there was- That's right. If there was a wedding during a weekday, I mean, would you be open to having the music stop at an earlier time? I would, uh, I would, uh, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, I wouldn't mind that condition at all. Again, uh, the whole point of listening to the community is trying to, to strike the balance between uh, protecting it, preserving it, honoring it, but also uh, having it be sustainable and, and, and to do it in a, in a way that's not overly restricting. Sure, right? absolutely. But in a way that's, that's fair. So I'm, I'm uh, again, I've, all, I've been completely open about all this uh, as well. But the real bottom line on this is uh, I live there. I love it there. I want to share it with the community. It's the bottom line. I don't need to do this. Right. Not for money, not for anything. Thank I you. want to do it. So, Thank you. Yeah. So okay. it sounds like perhaps a condition where the music stops at 10 on a week end and maybe at 9, I think is what I heard you say, on a week day would be appropriate. And it seems like the applicant is more than willing to agree to those conditions. So it's probably the weekend would be defined as a Friday night, Saturday night, and then Sunday night through Thursday night, nine o'clock. Yeah, I think that would be logical. Okay. We can, we can add that in the condition. Um, I did have a couple of other questions um, about the buffer being destroyed. Was that, I mean, was that something that the buffer was supposed to be maintained per previous um, approvals? So the only approvals that have taken place on the property were the application of a neighborhood landmark and the application of a historic landmark. Neither of those applications include any sort of plan or requirement of any preservation of any uh, landscaping or buffering. So those are simply the placement of the um, overlays. Um, the historic uh, protects the buildings. The neighborhood landmark is what allows for additional uses. So this is where they're establishing the uses and creating the plan. Um, but there wasn't anything in either of those previous approvals. Okay. So sorry for the applicant. Maybe just one more question. So have you been destroying the buffer? Maybe destroying. Should, it's like, I don't know uh, what that means. Yeah. What Maybe mean? I shouldn't <laughs> say it so uh, aggressively. Have you been um, the landscaping? I guess vegetation around there. Have you been clearing it? I mean, it, it would make sense if you're preparing this. No. So okay. Um, the the the. Uh, uh, field across the creek you can see over there when in 2000 you can look at maps it was just a field 
and then the people I bought it from, you know, nature takes over anything if it, you just don't do nothing with it. So it's brambles and this and that and the other. So actually, I've, I'm beautifying it. I went through and uh, cut trails that go through there and have opened it up. And now you got the coyotes, of course, but it started with deer, and that was real beautiful. And they come on through, but I actually have plans to do some, some I've, I've added to the landscape. I've planted trees and flowers and vegetation and azaleas and dogwoods. And I've, I've, I've far, uh, I forget what you said, uh, destroyed it. I've, I've enhanced it. Yeah. Uh, so, so clearing maybe is the better word. Oh, to use. Uh, yeah. So um, there, there was a bramble thicket field where people are going to park that several years ago I cleared as a green space uh, for my kids uh, to run and play and have fun and throw football and do all that stuff we do. And that's actually where we're going to do uh, parking is, is there. It's just that we're not going to do a parking lot. It's a grassy field where people can come. Uh, you do the numbers, uh, the minimum. Uh, would be maybe 50 people. I don't know. I haven't decided what that, but the maximum is 200. So at 200, based on it's not three per car, it's 2.5, yeah. 67 cars coming in an area that's like an acre and a half field. So I think it'll be minimally impactful to the, to the uh, landscape and that everything I've done is actually added to the value of the landscape in every single way. And I've got plans to do more uh, as this all evolves. So the max number of 200 people, is that like a fire marshal requirement? No, that's me. Okay. That's me saying, uh, you know what, that's about right for the space. Uh, my wedding was 200 people. That worked out real nice. You know, do about this, do, you know, that's all it is. Okay. And so it feels right. And it doesn't feel, you could do more, have more, but it just, it feels like it'll be nice for the, for the noise, for the traffic, for the vibe. And, uh, yeah, you know, that's just sort of, again, what, what, what occurred to me to be not a good fit. I got gotcha. you. So I don't think anyone is um, debating whether you would be a responsible um, owner and operator of this property. I guess a lot of questions um, that come to us, maybe wasn't posed today specifically, but if you were to ever sell the property, um, who then makes sure that all of these things that you're agreeing to are actually enforced as it relates to the property? That's it's why I'm asking about conditions being put in the um, the plan to make sure that I have no doubt that you're going to keep your word, everything yeah. that you're saying, but if the property were ever to be held in another person's hands, then make sure that these conditions are then also comply with in the future. I don't know what y'all's power to do, but you, maybe you could say if I ever sell it, somebody's got to come back and redo the thing. I, I know this. Yeah. Uh, the property's had seven different owners, from Jim Denny, who's in the Country Music Hall of Fame, to uh, uh, Carl Smith in the Country Music Hall of Fame, to June Carter, to Mother Maybell on the Country Music Hall of Fame, to Carlene Carter, to John Meyer, who I bought it from, and uh, I called it the barn at Mayo Farm because I put my own name on it. Uh, I ain't uh, selling the place. Uh, I've got my okay. children's children. That's why I protected it, you know. So, and uh, but I don't. I can't really answer specifically what if I sell it because that's a legal thing. Yeah. No, right. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I, that wasn't yeah. really meant. Yeah. For you so to, you can sit down. Oh. We're good. Um, that that was a staff. question. Yeah, it is a staff question because there is a clarification. We can clarify that, Commissioner. Staff, so um, if a so the neighborhood landmark development plan that would that is going through approval, which also still does go to council, keep that in mind with the pr changed process, this still requires council approval, but any conditions that are applied here would continue um, if the property was sold. Got you. Um, so I, I definitely think the conditions regarding the time of the music stopping, so 10 p.m. on the Friday and Saturdays, and then um, 9 p.m. on the rest of the days would be logical. I, um, I don't want to over condition the property, which is one of the comments that you made. Um, 200 people seems like a reasonable amount of people to have um, at this location, and it sounds like um, the applicant's completely fine with that, too. I guess, I mean, if, it's, if it makes sense now, I would imagine that it would make sense in the future and probably continue to um, protect the neighbors if you put um, a maximum amount of people who could attend an event like that. I also don't know, I mean, I know that I don't know the future, and so I don't want to over condition property in the future if the, if the noise concerns can be adequately addressed through other conditions. Um, one, one last question. So weddings and quote unquote events are allowed at the property. That's right. Is there, there, but there's any definition to events? Is it just the generic? It is. I mean, yeah, it's, 
it's generic. There's not a definition of event in the uh, zoning code. Okay. Well, I mean, the, the concern obviously would be the noise, and so I think if we could address that with other conditions, that'd be fine. Not a rock concert. No outdoor amplification. It's already the law. <laughs> <laughs> what rock group would want to play there? Um, <laughs> a really yeah. quiet. Well, I'm just kidding. But good, very good points. Anything else, Commissioner? No. Okay, I want to make sure we get everybody covered. Um, Commissioner Tibbs? Um, so, of course, I'm very excited that uh, you guys, you're doing this project. Um, especially in light of just, you know, some recent projects where just historical things just forgotten about and because of the rich history, I'm really um, appreciative of, of what you've done and I won't reiterate what happened in 2016, so I'm glad the landmark is there. As uh, Councilor Commissioner Michelle said, there's so few times where you, this is going to have a life because you've got a use for it. So uh, I have I think that you've been very uh, conscientious of your neighbors. Um, I'm actually, and I'll be supportive because you're supportive, but I'm not, uh, actually wouldn't say all these extra conditions because the noise ordinance itself is very restrictive and two phone calls to the police say you're disturbing the peace, all that changes. So I'm not necessarily, but if you're willing to do the 10 o'clock and you don't want Commissioner Blackshear's horns there. That's that's fine, <laughs> but uh, but I, I you know I I I I guess in my younger days, some of my music got loud, so I know what it's like to get the you know there. So um, so anyway, I'm very much supportive of it, and if you're supportive of the conditions, then I would be too. I, I did want to make one point. Sorry. She wants. To <laughs> <laughs> we, I would love for you to make it. About the, you, the calling the police as a resort, um, we have heard a lot of short-term rental um, testimony in the past few years, and a lot of people call the police when there's loud noise. Our police have a lot of really serious things to attend to, so a noise complaint probably is not going to be the highest on their top 100 things to address in a timely manner. Um, so it's not it, it's not a simple resolution to say, oh, I will call the police on them, um, so they can they can operate in a way that will cause um, disturbing levels of noise because my resort is to call the police. I mean that if the police don't get there when the noise is being played, or if the police take too long to get there, or your children wants to go to sleep before the police gets there, it's just not an easy resolution. So I do applaud the applicant for agreeing to respect the neighbors' wishes and, and, and cut the music down at, at a sufficient time for, for them to enjoy the rest of their evening. Thank you, Commissioner. And, I, and Councilman, I know you raised your hand, so I, I, was, I meant to go back to you, so now I'm going back to you. Thank you. So uh, you guys didn't know this about me, but I have performed 800 weddings since uh, I got elected. And uh, I know people think that weddings can be uh, noisy, but that is not necessarily what happens. So just assume, to assume that in a wedding will be a noise creating thing is, is really not necessarily what happens. Anybody needs to get married, they can call me. I'm happy to. <laughs> uh, I'm on a mission to, to beat a record. But uh, the other thing is, talking about noise and the police, I can tell you also, I know before I complain about uh, hypocrisy in uh, creating uh, rules and then without enforcement. But I have to say that the police, uh, in my experience, is very diligent about noise. Uh, I had a, 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 a place for people to uh, have weddings, actually, in my district. And people were complaining about noise, and the police got into uh, trying to address that to the point that they had to soundproof the place, and, and so they, the neighbors stopped complaining. So. In my experience, uh, noise seems to be a, a concern of them. Uh, now, I can't speak about the short-term rentals. That's uh, I don't have many of those in my district, thank God. But uh, the the issue with uh, with noise of these event centers, they seem to they seem to address them. So, just wanted to share that information. Thank you, Councilman. Very informative. Vice Chair. Um, 
I think we have discussed this at length. <laughs> uh, I, I actually wanted to comment on all of the conditions with the traffic and parking. I don't think I've ever seen so many details included on access points and what language needs to be on invitations and talk about enforcement challenges. I'm not sure how that will be done, but obviously the applicant has thought through a lot of issues and tried to do what he could to, to make this work well for the community. Um, I'm thinking about all of the other landmark um, plans that we have done. We definitely have added hours. I think about our bike shop on Shelby that can't be open past three on Saturday and this and that. So um, I am very comfortable with a condition that puts uh, limits on time, you know, sound at night. Um, so I'd be happy to make a motion unless we have further discussion. Well, uh, Vice Chair, it might be appropriate for uh, Commissioner Blackshear to make um, a, a motion sure. and you second. And I think the motion would include two additional um, conditions. And those would be, I want to make sure I get this right, um, Commissioner, would be um, time limitations, Saturdays and Sundays would be 10 p.m. And then Sunday through Thursday, 9 p.m., and then the second condition would be a max of 200 people. Is that correct? Or um, is there? Well, yeah. Well, the 200 people, I'm not necessarily married to that condition. So if there were um, concerns amongst the commissioners about that being inappropriate, I'm, I'm fine. Well, I think the applicant, to me, has said that he would limit it to 200 if he ever sold the property, then that would be on the... It would be a condition. Then, then I'm, I'm fine. I mean, I, I don't want to overly restrict your use of the property. I just wanted to address the neighbor's concerns about the noise. So, I mean, if you're... Well, let's make sure. Is the applicant okay with those two additional... He's he's nodding yes. Okay. Okay, for the record. Uh, yes plus vendors, of course. 200, 200 guests. Okay, 200 guests plus vendors. May I clarify? Yeah, our director. So um, I just want to make sure I heard it's Friday night and Saturday night, 10 o'clock. Yeah. Right? Okay. Is that right? That's right. So is it now time to make the motion? The time cut off for amplified, the time cut off for amplified music. Inside. So, so I'm sorry, just to clarify. So there's a condition that exists that says no outdoor amplification is permitted. That's just general. Then, um, Commissioner Blackshear, based on your engagement, what I was hearing was that music would stop at 10 o'clock on Friday and Saturday, and that um, all the rest of the days of the week, it would end at 9 o'clock. Right. Does that yeah. Music? There's a, the amplification on yes. number five is standard. No, but, but are we saying no amplified music after 10 o'clock? Just no music, period. No amplified, no amplified, no amplified music, music after, after 10. 10. I'm not sure that that was actually teased out in the discussion, but. Yeah, I think amplified music is. Yeah, the yeah you're right. If you're inside the barn, I don't think unamplified music would be problematic. So that would be. And I know that the council lady would bring it back if there was a problem. <laughs> and we would hope that the ordinances would handle that. Yes. Um, yeah. Oh. My associates here want me to point out that Christ okay. Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve is on a Monday night. <laughs> But, I mean, we're starting to go down a rabbit hole. Like, what is a holiday? A federal holiday? Like, some people don't get the holidays off. <laughs> okay, so I think, the, so let's, let's talk, okay, let's make sure we, we, we're good on these two conditions, and it would be no amplified, me, the motion is, to be clear, no amplified music past uh, 10 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday nights. Friday, Saturday. <laughs> Friday and Saturday nights. Now I'm confused. And then no amplified music past 9 p.m. on Sunday through Thursday nights. And we can exclude federal holidays. Does that I mean? Does that cause the neighbors any concerns? No. All right. So, and we can do that. And then um, no more than 200 people max. 
Do we get that, Director? Yes. yes. Right. So, yes. Yeah, plus 200 vendors. guests. So noted. 200 guests. Okay. All right. So noted. And then that's a, that's a proper motion. Is there a second? What? <laughs> Did it get motion? It, Where, motion are we still in discussion? This is, well, this yeah. would be your motion. Well, wait, wait. Yes. Do we have to put the 200 guests? I just feel like no. we get really nitpicky, and then we're going to have to, like, say, oh, wait, your guest 202. Get out of here. Okay, so it's just... Um, Council, hold the on applicant, one. The applicant is willing to do 200 guests, and it is in the best interest of the community to leave it at 200 guests, and it's already in the conditions, and, and I respectfully mm -hmm. request for it to remain there. All right. All right, so the, the council, do we, we want to keep the 200 guests as a condition? Okay. It's already in the plan details. In the plan details? Okay, so we don't We just want to make sure, I don't want to mess this up because yeah. these are kind of. So, I mean, is there any benefit to including it in the conditions if it's in the plan details? So we can leave it out as a condition. If it's in the plan, it's okay to leave it in the plan. We don't have to add a separate condition. Okay. Okay. So there's only the one condition on the, uh, the amplified the music, music, 10 p.m. Right. So make your motion, if oh you would, Lord. Commissioner. Okay. <laughs> I move to um, uh, recommend uh, or approve staff's recommendation of approval with conditions plus the additional condition of Amplified music inside of the barn stopping at 10 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays, excluding federal holidays. I hope that's not problematic. I know a lot of people want to speak, but I, we're done with the public hearing, unfortunately. Um, no, excluding the next one is excluding federal holidays. Right, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, in a condition of amplified music inside the barn stops at 9 p.m. on Sundays through Thursdays, excluding federal holidays, in which case the music would stop at 10 p.m. That's it. It's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. All right. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the, the staff's report with the, all of those conditions say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Ayes have it. And it passes. So we, it is, um, we've been here for about two hours and 15 minutes, and we have two items left. And so um, we're going to take a, if it's without objection, we'll take a quick break, and we'll be back in about 10 minutes. left and um, we are on item number 14. Go ahead. Okay, this is a request to rezone property at 1218 Montgomery Avenue in East Nashville. Properties outlined in red is located on the southwest corner of Douglas Avenue in Montgomery Avenue. The request is rezoned from specific plan residential to multifamily residential. Staff is recommending approval. The existing zoning is single family or I'm sorry, is residential specific plan. This permits single family residences as well as detached accessory dwelling units. Proposed zoning is multifamily residential alternative, could put, permit up to three units, maximum of two units. This is an East Nashville community plan. The policy is urban neighborhood evolving. Urban neighborhood evolving is a residential policy and is intended to create and enhance urban residential neighborhoods to provide more housing choices, improve pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicular connectivity moderate to high density development patterns with shallow setbacks and minimal spacing between buildings. RM15 is appropriate under this policy given its location, surrounding conditions, and design requirements. The site is within close proximity of a center policy area. The site is located along Douglas Avenue, which is a busy mixed-use collector between Ellington Parkway and Dickerson Road. 
The site has good access as an area with strong street network. RM15A zoning requirements are consistent with the policy in terms of urban form. It starts a transition from the more intense policy area along Douglas to the T4NM policy area along into the south. Permits development consistent with the emerging development pattern along Douglas and is consistent with the Highland Heights supplemental policy which directs more intense development along Douglas. Inclusion staff is recommending approval. Thank you, and we'll open this item for public hearing. Is the applicant in the room? Come on up, sir. You have uh, 10 minutes, and then you can save two minutes of the 10 for a rebuttal. Okay. Welcome. And state your name and address for the record. My name is Michael Slowey. Uh, I live at 141 Saxon Miss Drive. Uh, not in the neighborhood, but I represent the owners, Sloan and Jordan Allison. Um, they are requesting to rezone the property to RM15A, which would allow uh, two more additional units built on the property. They, they just purchased the property in the fall uh, and renovated the home that's existing. Um, and it actually will be airing on television in a few weeks now uh, for the renovation. However, they would like to be able to uh, build two more units on the back half of the property. Um, <clears throat> I don't really uh, have a, I don't want to take up too much time, but uh, they, <coughs> they are um, getting ready to move into the, into the home and currently live in Huntsville, so they weren't able to attend this evening, uh, but they will be able to be here for the next, um, uh, the February 5th council hearing, and then also um, the neighborhood uh, association meeting, which is held in the second week of February. Um, we have also, I went to uh, their neighborhood association meeting a couple weeks ago and uh, expressed our interest in, in doing this rezoning. Um, and I didn't see any uh, feedback that was negative. I also spoke very briefly at the very end of the meeting. So um, as far as what we're intending to do is to build two more units on the, on the back half of the property that have access on the alley uh, on the rear and they will face Douglas Avenue, which is a, a, obviously, as Jason said, is a collector street, a transit avenue uh, that, that will allow for two more additional units on the property. Um, and the current zoning at SPR is, I know that um, there's a lot of concern about uh, short-term rentals, especially in this neighborhood, um, but the current zoning as a SPR uh, already allows short-term rentals as a detached well, uh, excuse me, detached accessory dwelling. Um, so, going from RM15 or from SPR to RM15A won't really necessarily change uh, the e existing property, except for allowing two more units, and they can be sold separately. But that was that was where we're that's where we're at. So, uh, I think that's all I need. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll save two minutes uh, for the rebuttal. And Councilman, I know you're here. I uh, want to make sure that um, at the end we'll recognize you as our normal practice, if that's okay with you. Okay. Is that, you're okay, Councilman? That, okay, perfect. We'll make sure. So anyone wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Appreciate y'all coming down and... Um, you know the drill? Uh, I do know Steve. the drill, but I'm going to let Stacy speak first. Okay. Come on up. <laughs> I told her ladies could go first. Perfect. Know, good to yes, see yes. you. Yes. Welcome. So good evening, commissioners. My name is Gordon Stacy Harmon. No surprise. 1826 Joy Circle is where I reside. I had some prepared notes um, that I wanted to read, but I think I want to save those for the next case. Instead, I want to tell you a little story about a trip I recently took, and it was to Dubrovnik. And if anybody has ever been there, it's a real famous area for Game of Thrones. Um, a lot of scenes around King's Landing has been there. I bring this up for one simple fact. The walled city of Dubrovnik is a very popular place to pe for people to go and visit. Before the war, the Bosnian-Serbian War from about 20, 25 years ago, there were 6,000 residents that lived within the walled city. After, and during the war and after the war, a lot of residents moved out because there had been a lot of damage to that neighborhood and to that particular city. Today, there are roughly 1,200 people that live within the walled city. I was talking to a local guide there that was walking around with us, and I asked that particular person, wow, that means there's that many vacancies. I mean, what are the homes selling for in this particular area? Oh, there's no vacancy. They're all short-term rentals. That little walled city relies on a heavy tourist trade during the summer. The rest of the time of the year, their city's virtually empty. 
We don't want to see those types of things happen to our neighborhood. Short-term rentals go counter to the housing stock argument that we have been faced with and have been talked to for months, for years. We need housing stock, we need housing stock, we need housing stock. That's great. We don't mind three houses on a lot like this. But when you turn that housing stock into short-term rentals and de facto hotels, that goes counter to the argument we need density for housing stock. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Hi. Um, good evening. Ashanti Davis. I live at 321 Edwin Street. Um, I was here in December 12th when this one of this matters was deferred by the council member, and there was a lot of discussion about, you know, being dissatisfied with our reaction to this particular zoning change. And as someone who has lived in the neighborhood my entire life, who's a regular person too, it's not necessarily neighbor against neighbor or neighbor against developer. What it's really about is, like you guys have heard all evening from the other people, so I won't belabor it. When you change the zoning, when the zoning is pretty consistent throughout an area, it infringes and it impacts the property rights of other people who live there. This lot is about the same size as my lot. It's, it's right there at two tenths of an acre. There's a modest home there right now, and even though the applicant made it seem like, well, what's two additional homes? Two additional homes on two tenths of a lot is a lot because the lot's already small. And so where Stacy and I, are, what I'm gonna hit that he didn't say is if you walk down the street on Douglas at the corner of Douglas and Stanback, when you guys heard one again where they added four to a lot about the same size, it's been sitting there for over, like almost a year now. It's an eyesore, they can't finish it because it doesn't fit on the lot. So planning recommended approval, it was approved, and then once they get into the building phase, they realize, oh, this doesn't fit. And instead of demolishing it or reworking it, it's just sitting there as a dumping ground in our neighborhood and it's an eyesore. The reason why I'm here is just because like, I think we have to be thoughtful about, I'm not against density, and I know the argument for density, and I support that, but you have to put density where it will fit, and I don't think two-tenths of a lot is appropriate for three houses in light of the existing infrastructure. Thank y'all. Thank you. Anyone else? You're welcome. Uh, hi, good evening, commissioners. I'm Sean Parker. I live at 1004 Spain Avenue. Um, I was reading through the staff report on this proposed zoning change, and um, points out that this is a uh, bike lane and bus route. Um, it's, it's a two lane street, um, and I feel like I wasn't actually clear until just now about what the plan was for this, that they were renovating that. I didn't know if it was gonna be four units or, or what, with what's, what's allowed with the density, but so I presume that the two new units will face Douglas Avenue. Um, so if those are used as short term rentals, what we're gonna see is uh, rideshare cars stopping on Douglas to load and unload those people. And we already have like a little bit of that because rideshare drivers tend to not use even driveways. And in this case, the access to the driveway is through an alleyway and I, I just don't see short term, I'm sorry, rideshare drivers using the, uh, the alleyway. So what that causes on a two lane road, it's a bus route, you know, the bus comes up behind, it has to go around a car, it goes into the other lane. Um, it's, it's pretty much the only bike route we have east-west in the 5th District. Um, Trinity doesn't have lanes, Cleveland no longer has lanes. So um, yeah, out of traffic considerations, I think that this is probably not the right move for this parcel. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, re rebuttal and then Councilman will, will let you go last. So, um, so um, uh, with regard to short-term rentals, um, this couple that lives there will be living on the property as well, and I don't think that they would be interested in something that is negatively impacting their property. Uh, that is their closest, uh, their closest neighbor would be next door. Um, and so I, <clears throat> I, I see the argument for short-term rentals, but as, as a, um, as the, the reason that we're trying to rezone it, they, they renovated their home and they're trying to pay for those renovations. They got a loan, they're trying to pay for those renovations by, by rezoning and, and building property and then they will be able to sell those individually. So what they're doing with, or who they are selling it to, I mean, that would be, I would assume they would have a very good, uh, <laughs> I guess, um, knowledge of what their intent is. And I don't think that it would be, they would be in, in their best interest to 
sell it to a, a developer that's coming in just to get a cash cow out of a out of their own property. Um, so that uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. And seeing no one else wishing to speak, Councilman, come on up. Thank you, everybody, um, for being here and volunteering your time, as usual, and all the hardworking people at the planning staff. <sighs> We've we looked at Douglas twice, actually technically three times. Uh, we looked at it with Nashville Next. We identified it as a street appropriate. You know, we have industrial, commercial, multifamily use all down Douglas. This property is really close to the train tracks, which the density helps buffer the noise. And also, besides putting it, when we studied the Highland Heights area a little bit, you know, we included Douglas. And then we studied it more when we re-studied the Highland Heights plan even more, which was awesome. And, you know, and I thank you once again for planning and their patience and all the hard work that planners and the staff and the commissioners did when we looked at that plan, not just once, twice, but three times. Now, I am in support of this, you know, because it's consistent and meets the policy. Staff has recommended approval. Um, I understand the um, issue with the short-term rentals. And on the meeting on December 12th, it'll be, I will let you know and show you why I was very upset regarding the, the next case, not this case. And one thing I want to make clear, not for myself, but for the person that, is, that, that sits in the seat after me, um, any neighbor from any association has a right to come and speak for or against, okay? But out of courtesy, um, the developer wasn't the developer and the homeowner who's who's remodeling their their house so they could live in it didn't like the fact that I deferred this twice, you know because I made them defer it twice because you need to go talk to Cleveland Park, which is the neighborhood boundaries they fit in, this is where they they they're going to be at, and regardless, mean council member deferred it not once but twice, and. The, the young man came and talked to our neighbors. They have to come back again. So we're going to continue this process, and they're going to come back. And I do have an option, you know, if the new neighbors who are going to be residents, you know, from Huntsville, um, I could restrict possible type twos and threes with a SP on third if I, if, if, if I want to. You know, or if the neighbors and the owners see, you know what, we're not, we're okay with that, because they're going to have to live there too. You know, or I could say that one new unit, or that it has to be just type ones, which is owner occupied, must, you know, there's things I can do, but move this forward, please, so that we can continue on the process, and they'll be coming back to the neighborhood once again, because they're going to be living there, and. And then I, and I did the requirements, you know, like, hey, you need to talk to my neighbors. So I did the whole, no, sorry, developer. Sorry, new neighbors. I'm glad you're coming and living here, but we're going to defer you not once, we're going to defer you twice. And so I'm asking for your support. And I appreciate my neighbors from East Hill, which are great neighbors. I appreciate and love my neighbors from Highland Heights. They're very intelligent. And my neighbors from East Hill are very intelligent and great people, have great concerns. However, though, this is a Cleveland Park matter. And what I encourage my neighbors, instead of having seven neighborhood association meetings, technically eight when we count the ones that meet quarterly, you know, instead of having eight different steering committee meetings, you know, let's consolidate. You know, so developers aren't confused, or even people that have good projects and people who just want to alert the neighborhood aren't going to a bunch of different places. And whoever the next council member or mayor, who she or he will be, you know, just consolidate, you know. And Thank well, you that's guys. it. Appreciate it. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, we'll declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Sims, you want to go first? Um, I think. Um, I, I have a question, but basically about at what point, where is our our responsibility? He said he can limit types two and three, but are we allowed to limit 
type two and three of short-term rentals? Just by way of context, since it's yeah. been a while since we looked at the STR, I want to answer your question. Yeah, good, um, yeah. If Lisa, if you could just remind the commission what the citywide framework did for STRs, and then answer Council Lady, excuse me, Commissioner Sims' question, <laughs> and then I want to offer a comment about the STRs. So as a reminder in regards to the current um, regulations for short-term rentals uh, on a countywide basis, um, 608, Bill 608, which was approved, um, revised the requirements on short-term rentals and actually changed them. There is no longer a type two or type three. Um, that was part of the previous regulations. So there are now two categories of short-term rental properties in the zoning code. Um, the first is short-term rental owner-occupied, which is classified as a residential use um, in the land use table. The second type is uh, short-term rental not owner-occupied, which is classified as a commercial use. Short-term rental owner-occupied are permitted as accessory uses in most all districts. Um, those are ones which, as they say in their name, are permits that are issued for properties that are occupied by the owner of the property. Short-term rentals uh, not owner-occupied are permitted in most of the, are permitted in the multifamily zoning districts, RM, uh, 4, 6, 9, 15, 20, 40, I can't remember what else. Um, but the multifamily zoning districts, mixed use zoning districts, um, and commercial and the other zoning districts. And so those are not permitted in the R or RS districts. And so that was one of the changes that was made with the countywide framework that was adopted. Um, they're permitted as um, a use permitted with conditions um, in the code uh, in those districts where they are. There are operational criteria that are outlined in the zoning code for both owner and not owner occupied. Some of the things that those that have to do is that you have to get certain um, inspections for fire, um, those sorts of things that you have to have a permit, that you have your permit has to be displayed on any of the uh, advertising that you may use, whichever company it is. Um, there are also occupancy restrictions that are outlined in there based on the number of rooms um, and beds that are in the facility. Um, and so that's kind of the basis of the countywide framework. Two types, um, one owner, one not, and where they were permitted. Do you want me to answer the second? Okay. In regards to the second part of the question, which I think would be is um, can you all restrict uh, not owner occupied as it relates to like a straight zoning request mm -hmm. such as RM15, mm -hmm. such as this? Mm -hmm. And um, the quick answer to that is no. Um, and here's a more extended answer as to why the answer is no. So the state, um, state of Tennessee, through Tennessee Code Annotated, essentially grants powers to municipalities um, for various uh, planning and zoning authorities. Um, the, we are only allowed to do that which they grant us, and they grant us the authority to adopt a zoning code, which is what has been done, and that is adopted by Metro Council. And so in adopting the zoning code, the Metro Council has established the, um, oh, Hide that. Um, so in adopting the zoning code, the Metro Council has established um, the standards for these districts, these base zone districts. So the Metro Council has adopted the RM15, in this case, RM15A district with a certain set of standards and certain allowances. And so we can't go in and further restrict on a case-by-case -case basis because the council has already set the legislative framework that we work within. And we, our council is here, and, and the council, our legal council, are, are you in occurrence with that? We want to make sure everybody's on the same. I could not have said it better myself. Okay, so <laughs> legal council is here to always help us and uh, assist us, so we thank you for that. So when Councilman Davis says he can take it back to council and restrict STRs, he really, he, can he? 
Well, so with zoning legislation, um, which is different some, from some other legis types of legislation that the council um, considers, zoning legislation is amendable up to third reading. We have seen in the past, and, and I think that what the councilman is referring to, and he alluded to, was we have seen council members convert a straight zoning a request to RM15 to an SP. And the SP is the tool by which, because the zoning code outlines SPs as being a more um, customizable approach, um, we have seen council members uh, convert straight zonings to SPs on third reading to um, allow for more um, a, a more uh, structured approach to the uses. <coughs> So in this, our choices would be to either keep it SPR if we vote no, or we could ask for, can we keep it with an SP with restrictions? We could say we allow three, but no, but we want to keep it an SP so you don't put in this short-term rentals. So I think therein lies what is probably a very challenging moment for the commission with respect to right. short-term rentals. Um, the application before us is for a multifamily district, and so as one, you know, one of the big, one of our most important tenants is that diversity in neighborhoods is good for a, a range of, of reasons. Mm -hmm. And I think we had historically thought of that as something related to form, to density in the right places and the like. That was sort of the basis mm -hmm. of that decision. But now that we have a citywide framework that says STRs are permitted in these multifamily uh, zoning districts, mm -hmm. I think the, the dilemma is, um, you know, I would hate to see us not support RM districts just because of STRs and yes. sort of move to requiring SPs for everything mm -hmm. because, you know, we've we've refined the RM districts to include A districts and the like to sort of reflect sort of the design goals and the other goals that we might, you know, be able to accomplish with an RM zoning. Mm -hmm. But I think to your question, you know, can we sort of begin to say we just want SPs yeah. so that we can restrict the uses? I would just... I understand the place where that's coming from because STRs have been so debated within our community and at the commission. I would just caution right. that two points, that the commission adopted the citywide framework, council approved it, and so we, we have a working standard that was debated. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, I think as a commission we've got to think, and perhaps this is a good topic for a work session mm -hmm. about the precedent and other issues that might be created by sort of taking a particular use within one zoning district and sort of having a response that says we're going to, you know, just, just to manage that use. It's not legislating, but it's coming close to mm -hmm. sort of that place where we're reframing the citywide framework. Right. Th that's my caution. Um, and I think this is just gonna be a difficult issue that we grapple with. I can't come to you today and say we have the, yeah. the precise answer on how to resolve that, but I think there would be implications if we began to, you know, right. seek to restrict that one use just using SPs. So. We looked at this fairly as we would any zone case against the policy and with the location and says and said, well, the policy supports this particular zone district. And so that's how we arrived at the recommendation. If that answer, it's a, it's probably unsatisfactory as an answer, Commissioner, but no, it's really a difficult, it's a difficult issue. It's a very difficult issue because um, I think in looking at case by case, which is what I think some of my clarity is, is do we, are we, should we just look at this one case? Mm -hmm. What we know from hard research coming out and, and it's even starting to be significant on the research being done in Nashville is that short term rentals really do drive up rental costs and they really do limit housing, the housing stock. Mm -hmm. So if you make a decision that's legal, is it right? Mm -hmm. And those, for me, that's a, when we get in that kind of either or, then we don't have room to be creative, which I think is part of our job is to negotiate well between two parties that don't necessarily have the same goal. Um, and so I, it puts us in a really hard place and so I'm not sure how we get out of that hard place because just looking at this one case, I can see certainly how the staff got to approve. 
But if I couch that decision in the bigger arena of true research that says this actually hurts Nashville over the long haul, and then that's not just my opinion, that's coming out of hard research in the planning area, it's left like we have two bad choices instead of a good one. And so I guess I just want to listen to the rest of my, my team here, my, my, my commission. Commissioner Governor. <coughs> Well, I tend to understand where the staff's coming from as well. What is the dimensions of this lot? That's a good question. <coughs> if you'll give us just a moment, okay. um, someone can pull it up on the map. So under SP zoning, as it's currently, is it's currently zoned? Um, how did it get to be SP? So it's part of the larger Cleveland <coughs> Park specific plan that was adopted that permits um, detached accessory dwelling units. And so it's part of a large area SP that was essentially created to allow for some flexibility. It permits the addition of a detached accessory dwelling unit and then all other uses of RS5. And so it, it essentially is just an overlay to permit some detached accessory dwelling units. That's a large area. Okay. So it, dwelling units, detached dwelling units, does that mean they could have more than one detached dwelling unit? Uh, it's limited to one. Okay. It is limited to one detached accessory dwelling okay. unit. Okay. The dimensions, do you find them? Uh, yes, it's um, 45 by 141. Yeah, 45 feet off the other side. I, I, just, I think it's going to be a real challenge to get three units on that. I don't know how they might do that. Uh, but again, I kind of understand where the staff's coming from, and I tend to agree with it. Commissioner Moore. So I, I think I struggle pretty much like you do, Commissioner Sims. So, and you may have mentioned this, Lisa, with the RM zoning, um, if they have three um, dwellings on that property, can each of those be a short-term rental? Or is there how? What is the, I guess, ratio? Per the per the countywide framework that was adopted by um, recommended approval here and adopted by the council, RM districts do permit both owner occupied and not owner occupied. There were no more um, percentages or restrictions per. Um, census tracts which existed in the previous versions. And so um, three, uh, there are some, some standards in the code that I'm not 100% familiar with as those are uh, interpreted by the zoning administrator, but the determination of the issuance of the permits would be based, would be left to the codes examiner, but RM does permit it. Um, thank you for that. I'd, I think I'm kind of at the same place. Standalone, it, it's fine. I think the implications, if we look at it on a larger scale, um, and I know we have another one coming up similar to this, but you know, more dense. But I'm going to just listen to the rest of the councilman. No comment. Commissioner Bichelle? Um Right across the street. Those there are a lot of little bitty units and um, units. yeah, um, so we're talking about and on this side of the street it's it's three units um, facing Douglas in every single parcel. It's just that actually the parcels are deeper than this one. This one's shallow to Douglas, but across the street. Um, there are a lot of units in a tiny space. So I'm trying to understand what would be the argument against doing something similar right across the street. If um, it stays the way it is and they want a short-term rental, it has to be owner-occupied. If we give it RM, it doesn't have to be owner-occupied. That's basically the only difference. Uh, right. The current SP, which is the DADU SP, um, because it would fall to the RS5, um, the standards of RS5, RS5 does permit owner-occupied short-term rentals, but not, not owner-occupied. 
Right. So right now it per, it allows one extra dwelling unit and the owners have to live there if they want to, to rent out that accessory dwelling as a short term. But right across the street, you've got one, two, three, four, I think five units in the same, sp or four units in the same space. I, um, I don't know. I, I'll listen. And the, the SP across the street is at a density of 15 units per acre, which was something that we took into consideration when looking at the request for RM15 on this side of the street. Commissioner Blackshear. Um, I, I do think this is a really tough one. I um, can certainly see why it would make sense to allow at least the possibility of building three dwelling units on this parcel, whether it's actually um, practical or not, because it'll have to be so tiny. Um, but you have right across the street, as Commissioner Bichelle pointed out, um, a pretty intense development. Um, in general, I think it would look um, a bit weird if you just looked at the map and looked at the zoning. You have SPR, which is basically RS5 with the DADU allowment, and then an SP across the street, and then RS5 to the right. Um, and then you're allowing just a straight zone change to RM uh, 15A, which that to me, it doesn't feel as offensive as it could feel because there is um, a, a high density development across the street, but I still don't like to see straight zone changes if it's just one lot in the middle of a, an otherwise fairly orderly zoning area. Um, so I'm, I'm still listening, still thinking. Commissioner Tibbs. Um, I, I, I guess I, I am a little concerned how three lots of work there, but I, I will say that um, I agree with staff's analysis of it. And it, it, you know, it seems to actually still, you know, fit with the policy and the proposal area. As, as you said, I'm kind of the same way with one lot zone change, but it, it seems consistent and um, Douglas being what, you know, I mean, maybe an arterial, uh, I'm, I'm be comfortable with it. Um, uh, so I'd be supportive of uh, staff's analysis. Vice Chair. Oh, wait, hold on, Vice Chair, wait a second. Commissioner Bashil, did you have a question? I forgot. On the uh, west side of the frame on Douglas Avenue um, off of 30, oh, I don't know. Um, that little plot at the very end, what's that zoned? The one across from the CS on Douglas on the left-hand side. It looks like it has one, two, oh. three, four dwellings. Um, Hold on, we'll, we'll find out for you. Okay, and is that like the tip of an iceberg or is that one lot a different zone? That, that one, uh, the one on the south side of Douglas, uh, kind of in the corner of the screen, caddy corner from the CS is RM20A. It's RM20A, it is. and is it just that one lot or is that just, it's, it's, it's just, just that, that one, one lot? Yeah. It, it, if, I, if I may, it also is. No, can't. So, I'm sorry, public hearing's over, sorry. We'll get to that. You're okay. Vice Chair, you um, So I, I think I am uh, appreciate what Commissioner Blackshear just said. I mean, I was trying to think through this, and, and I do, since we put in place the citywide ordinance, I have been, our, our framework, um, definitely been concerned with the end around being getting a multifamily zoning in order to get a short-term rental into a neighborhood. Um, the argument, the other argument that you're making is that if it's consistent with policy, we should consider it, and this is this multifamily zoning would be consistent with policy. That said, if it's consistent with policy, I feel like it should be the corridor or, you know, multiple properties that front Douglas. It shouldn't just be one individual property that currently actually is fronting on Montgomery, if you look at the house. Um, the new houses would be fronting on Douglas, but the existing house is actually fronting on Montgomery, which is definitely a single family street. So when I think, is it appropriate to have one lot, you know, 
it might be consistent, but is that appropriate for the character of the neighborhood? And I would probably say it's not. I mean, that lot is, you know, very consistent with what you're seeing on the rest of the neighborhood. So, um, you know, I don't have a problem saying it's not consistent with the property across the street. That's a much larger, deeper property. Um, again, if we were sort of saying that entire block face was getting rezoned, I would have a higher comfort level with it. But doing one lot, even if it's consistent with policy, doesn't feel like it's the right approach. And um, so I don't feel like we're legislating out short-term rentals. I just think it's a question of, is it appropriate to rezone one lot, even if it's consistent with policy? All right, so um, we'll need a motion. And we can't leave until we, you know, <laughs> have a motion. I, I know there's a hesitancy, but we'll need a, a motion. Can I ask one other question? I mean, there Absolutely, is, we're in discussion. Too. There's still an opportunity. I mean, I would have a greater comfort. Well, I mean, so I understand also we don't want to just get rid of multifamily and then we don't want to replace it all with, with um, a specific plan. And I agree, as a policy, we don't. But when we're dealing with one individual lot, I think that's a different discussion. Um, and if this really was an option to try to get another home on there, wouldn't it be better to do it through a specific plan so you had some control over the placement? Yeah, the that? directors. So we, we have grappled with this internally quite a bit because I think there are a number of times when it would be far better to say to a developer, doing this at, as a one lot level doesn't work, particularly around infrastructure. and you know, to Armand's SPs, while a really excellent tool can can be used too much. And I think if you use them for a single property, um, that can also create issues, particularly on the enforcement side. We tend to prefer, I, I don't want to put it into, I mean, every case is different. But if you rezone to a base zoning district and you rezone other lots along Douglas to that same base rezoning district, then you're essentially creating some consistency there, whereas SPs tend to be different. Okay. And so you're looking at specific setback standards or height standards, and so when you do that on a lot-by-lot -lot basis, it can create some difficulty. So, um, but I think what I heard you say is you're not comfortable with this particular configuration of the property and that it's one property, it's not the STR issue. Um, so um, I, think, I think that can be a basis for, for a motion. Sure. It can be. <laughs> Sorry, that's hey, your job. No. <laughs> that's your job. <laughs> Thanks, director. I appreciate that. That's why we're such a good team. I know. All right. All right. Well, then I will step out on a limb and say I uh, – would make a motion to disapprove this zone change. Um, do I have to state any more than that? Yes. <laughs> I've disapproved this zone change uh, based on the fact that it, we're dealing with a single lot um, in a in a neighborhood that is zoned consistently RS5. Is that what you said? Basically RS5 with the DADU. With the DADU oh, overlay. Yeah. And I think that that allows... Uh, which allows the appropriate use of that lot. So that's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. Before you vote, could you? Just yeah, no, we're, so let, oh, let's get this. Yeah. Hold on, let's, let's make sure there's a second, and then we'll get back into discussion. Did, I did a second. So there's motion second, we're back in discussion. Yeah, I just want to, before I vote on it, so th the last part that you're saying about the DADU is allowed, could, could, you, um, could you repeat that one more time, that part? I, I got lost right there. Or, <laughs> That just said that, that that the existing zoning is appropriate with RS5, and this is out. You know, this is an outlier to that. Okay. But they are allowed to have a daddy on that property. Okay. Any other commissioner? Any other? Really a any other? No, it's a that's a proper motion in a second. So, uh, you know, motion to you're basically it's a motion to disapprove. So. Um, that's a proper motion, and there was a second. We're still on discussion. Any other discussion? All in favor? Of, well, let me make sure. Any other discussion, Commissioner Tibbs? Well, I'm just trying to absorb this just a little bit here, but I'm okay. I think I'm okay with it. Okay. Um, Change. Any other discussion? Just real quick. I, I mean, I understand where 
Vice Chair Farr is coming from on that, and I tend to agree. But at the same time, this makes sense, and I tend to agree with the staff. So. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the disapproval say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Aye. No. Um, let's do hands. So those uh, in for for disapproval, raise your hand. One, two. The dis the disapproval <coughs> of the. No, no, it's staff made a recommendation to approve, so it's a motion to disapprove. Uh, so all in favor, raise your hand of disapproval. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, and those no? One, two, three. So disapproval, um, four. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. All right. So the it's five, four, and uh, the motion is uh, to disapprove is approved. Oh my gosh, it's a mess, isn't it? So the motion that prevails is a disapproval, is a better way to state it. And I am passing over the chair and uh, come on down. And then, so we are on item 15 and I'm, I'm handing it to the vice chair. Thank you, vice chair. Looks exactly like, oh, that's the same one. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> Item 15. All right, item 15 is a request to rezone um, from specific plain residential to. Okay. <coughs> to um, RM 20A multifamily residential alternative zoning uh, for property at 108 Douglas Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Um, the site is located on. 0.19 acres um, at the corner um, at the, at the corner of Douglas Avenue and Joseph Avenue, um, and it currently contains a um, residential structure. The site has frontage on Joseph Avenue, um, Douglas um, Joseph Avenue, and Douglas Avenue, and an existing alley that runs parallel with the western property line, <clears throat> um, providing rear access to the the properties um, fronting Joseph and Dickerson. This slide shows the MCSP designations. Um, Joseph Avenue is a local street. Um, Douglas Avenue is a collector, uh, a collector Avenue, and then Dickerson Pike is an arterial boulevard on the MCSP. Dickerson is located about 150 feet west of the site. Um, as explained just now, the um, SP, the existing SP allows for detached accessory dwelling units um, with all other standards of the RS5 zoning district being applicable. Um, properties um, located directly west of the site uh, front Dickerson Pike and include higher intensity commercial and industrial uses um, in the CS commercial service zoning district. Uh, properties along Douglas Avenue um, uh, the Collector um, uh, uh, Avenue here contain a mixture of residential, commercial, and institutional uses um, that transition to primarily residential uses as you go east further um, into the interior parts of the neighborhood. The site is identified with a yellow star on the screen here. Um, it's located on the western edge of the T4 neighborhood evolving policy, um, adjacent to higher intensity policy areas along Dickerson Pike, um, including the T4 urban community center policy and the T4 mixed use um, um, corridor policy, which um, allow and support those um, additional density with uh, higher intensity uses. Um, for reference, the site is located outside, directly south of the Highland Heights study area. Um, as a reminder, the Highland Heights study was um, completed um, 
last year, and it was a neighborhood-led um, process um, that was adopted by the Planning Commission, and it serves as a guide for future development within the area. And the Highland Heights boundary is shown with this red line here. So we're located just outside of that. Um, Nashville Next identifies the site as within a tier two center um, depicted in this orange color, um, which is um, in close proximity to the uh, Dickerson Pike Corridor shown in this uh, thick blue line, which is a high capacity transit corridor. Um, and, a, and the community character um, manual recommends that properties um, that are in centers um, uh, or on the edge of evolving policy adjacent to centers um, are appropriate for higher density residential development in order to provide housing choice and proximity to goods and services, um, and also to, to serve as a transition from those higher intensity uses along the corridor to the neighborhood areas. The site is located um, also about 300 feet from an existing MTA bus stop um, identified here. And so here's the site and the stop is located on the same side or on the east side of Dickerson Pike, um, providing direct access uh, from the site to the bus stop. The ARM 20A zoning district is supported by the Urban Neighborhood Evolving Policy and is appropriate given the surrounding land uses and land use policies. The bulk and um, building placement standards associated with the alternative district ensure that the development will um, address the pedestrian realm and um, limit the amount of parking between the building and the street. Um, and therefore, staff recommendation is to approve. Thank you. We'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. Is the applicant here? Are you, uh, Councilman Davis, are you the applicant? Oh. I think Councilman Davis is the applicant. Thank you, Commissioners. I'm going to divert a little bit here. You take years, you study a policy, you work these poor planners to the bone without extra pay, without overtime. And, you know, they're great people, hardworking. And then you have long meetings, and several neighbors, business owners come out, and you fight. You gotta make it in policy. You gotta put it in the policy. We have commercial buildings on the same street. You have multifamily, already approved, on the same street. You know, but yet, sometimes we agree to disagree, even after all that work. And I understand certain concerns, but I try to be consistent. God knows I try, you know, but in the future, Maybe, it, maybe a little more guidance on my end. You know, if you do what you're supposed to do, you go in front of your neighborhood association. No one from that association comes out and fights it because it's on Douglas. It's a collector street, railroad track, industrial building, it's that Shell gas station, the Ellington Parkway coming through the neighborhood. This is a major arterial and collector street. So somebody in West Nashville, throws a wild party or so many Airbnbs downtown, you know, and Airbnb is an issue. But in my neighborhood, you know, people getting shot in some areas where a dope man's still on the corner is a little bit bigger concern at times. And providing housing, you know, and affordable housing is more important. And that relates to this next case, okay? So I'm Douglas once again, but this is a little different. This one is a little bit more important to me. Because this is a citizen. Not a citizen just trying to move here. Not a developer trying to make a buck. And this is the case I was upset about. And please excuse me, I'm gonna pass around my phone because it was sent by the homeowners who have lived in this neighborhood for 30 years. It's a double wide trailer on Douglas. And, and just for the record, so I'm clear, any of the neighbors here, are not the ones who did that. Just so I'm clear, any neighbors that are here 
aren't the neighbors that did that. And in fact, all the neighbors here probably condone the kind of activities that other neighbors were doing to this family on the street. Showing up, putting an afro on your head and showing up in blackface and pointing at their zoning sign and doing things related to their zoning. See, one thing we don't understand is, yes, you have a difficult job and I admire every one of you for it. But what goes through that homeowner's mind? When you say Nashville, we're for you. You can do the same thing as the builder does. But sometimes, and not intentionally, when we get on social media and we start disagreeing, we can be disagreeing respectfully, but then you have those few crazy neighbors that will see, oh, we got 15 people against it. You know what, I could abuse that person because they're not protected. And even though the person sending the email or doing social media is not the person doing it, there's consequences. And then at that particular meeting, when I see the neighbor that showed up with the Afro and in blackface, I went off. And, and, I'm, and, I'm, and, I, and that neighbor who I tracked down, I took that person to task, personally, not in front of everybody, okay? And sometimes, you know, as women and as people of color, you know, I, you know, when people get treated like that in our neighborhood, especially in my East Nashville neighborhood, that is unacceptable. And I think all of you in the crowd and everyone would agree that that is not cool. And the homeowner and her daughter who sent me the pictures will test to some of the treatments. But the most important thing, let's get back on task here, is the pro if this is within policy. Unfortunately, the homeowner's husband died and put the family in a little bit of financial straits. And they were getting offers to buy the property. And, I'm, and I'll be honest with you, I said, you know what, you're on Douglas, it fits the policy. You know, let's verify if you're planning and let's make it work. We located another home on Joseph, which they could afford to move into, you know, which we know national real estate, especially in the urban core, is getting higher. So we're like, let's look at the possibility, but we have to sell this property first. But once again, Nashville is a hot area. So the longer I defer or push back, which I did, you know, the chances of them losing that, but that's not your problem. And you have to go by the policy. You have to go by the policy and, and be the smart, wonderful bureaucrats that the planning staff members are. But I have to argue off of Moshe what's in the best interest of my constituents. And we may disagree with that, and we're still going to be friends as always. But this is different. And maybe, and, and maybe you know, sometimes, you know, I may need to leave the emotion out of it, you know. But if I can keep a long-term resident in a neighborhood, and put them in a brand new house and keep the bank from taking the, the, their, their double wide trailer on a collector street right next to Dickerson Road, right near the coffee shop, right across the street from a similar build as also. But if I'm concerned, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the case before me kind of concerned me a little bit too. And I just want you to understand that even though we may disagree and I love my wonderful neighbors for and against this, but when, but when we follow the policy, we have the intense meetings, when we go in front of neighborhood social, not once, not twice, and we go back again, and then nobody from that neighborhood, I'm talking about the last case, comes and fights it. I mean, what are we doing wrong here? And so, and so I'm gonna ask for your, your I don't, I'm not just trying to distribute this lewd photograph, but I do want to show you guys, you know, some of the stuff that they've been enduring. And I know you will not disapprove or approve based on any of this information, but just so we're all human here, and and even our consequences, even when we we bring a mob of people for or against, we have consequences, and we all need to be sensitive to sometimes you know, having a community meeting that was not announced, where we don't let the developer speak, you know, at times, not referring to any of these wonderful neighbors here, and I'm not being sarcastic, they're great people. I can love somebody and still disagree with them. You know, I love my wife, she disagrees with me. 
So I mean, it, it's, it's, not un, it's not uncommon here. But I am going to, to bring this forward. You know. just asking if this was allowed. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, well, I'm, not, I'm not totally clear what, are you passing around a cell phone or well, to internet? It was my cell phone, well, I'll email it's it. Fine. If, I, you'll, if I, you'll email it to us. I think we need to make it part of the record. It in the record. I just wanna make it yeah. part of the record. Okay, <laughs> but generally it depicts um, some It's got some. Defamation. But, but, it's black, but it's blackface and they, they put a, a, a Afro wig on their head and put, and use black makeup. Um, and was harassing my my constituents. Okay. And it, once again, it wasn't any of the any of the nice neighbors here. That's why I, I want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, you know, when you're a parent and you're yelling at one kid, the other kids may feel like you're yelling at them too. Well, that that is really disturbing, and I want to make sure that it is in the record associated with this yeah. case. So if you'll send it to me, um, then we'll make sure that it's available. Um, I'm I'm really. That's horrible, and we're sorry to hear that. That's horrible. Yeah, so that's why, mm -hmm. that's why my candor changed that particular meeting, because the individual was here. You, you mm -hmm. are agreeing with staff recommendation, though, right? Yeah, yeah I, rec I, I support the staff's recommendation. Okay. I thought so, but I yeah. just wanted to make sure. But I support it wholeheartedly, mm -hmm. and it fits the policy. And <coughs> once again, you know, thank you for your help. Thank you. So is there anyone here speaking in support? Speaking in support? You'll have two minutes and you can state your name, name and address. Hello, how's everyone doing? My name is Doris Covington and um, that's my resident. I'm the owner at 108 Douglas Avenue. Um, I've been there for 15 years now. Um, it's been a great neighborhood. I've seen a lot of changes there. And um, my thing is, I'm on the corner. I have the whole corner lot there. Um, I'm near the, um, well, they got the um, three buildings across from me, um, the tall ones they built. Um, and it's three there. But if they take the whole lot, it would have been like four. Mm -hmm. I may not have the density, but I do have the frontage. And um, when I got that place there, I had to come down here and Mr. Sonny West approved me getting my mod modular home put there. And I'm here today to ask, um, I lost my husband and I'm no longer able to keep up with what's coming down in the neighborhood. Dickerson Road is gonna be redone. I'm right there on the corner. When you look down the light, um, my marginal home, um, it really stands out there now. And I'm asking um, that it do get approved where some new um, beautiful places can be put there to keep up with what's coming along here in Nashville. And thank y'all for your time. Thank you. Anybody else speaking in support? Hi, my name is Will Johnson, and um, I'm actually her realtor, and I'm a little bit emotional because some of the backstory that she may not have told you, but I think it's important, is I'm the fourth realtor now that's taken on her property. So people had tried to sell it as is, and you know we're getting offers um, about $120,000, $130,000. She owes about $40,000 on the property. I took this on. I normally don't take on cases like this just because of the time intensity of it, but I said, look, I'll hold your hand, I'll walk you side by side, and, and the, really the way that you're gonna be able to make this thing work is by getting it rezoned. So she makes about $800 a month. She's a couple months away from losing this property to the banks. And so um, I said, whatever I can do on my end to be able to help push this thing through, but really it's gonna be in y'all's hands. It's not in my hands anymore. So um, she won't be living there much longer, um, and whether, 
she's able to sell it. I was able to find a buyer for her. So we, I've got everything streamlined and everything set up on, on my end, but everything that I can do on my side is, is done. And so um, if this gets rezoned, it's a major impact on her. If not, I mean, no exaggeration. I mean, this is somebody that could end up being homeless, not without a home. She doesn't have a husband anymore. She doesn't have any more family. She doesn't have, and I, I think this is a win for everybody. I mean, a mobile home does not fit in that subdivision. If you haven't had a chance to drive by, drive by, I think what the developer is looking at doing, I think it's a win for her. I think it's a win for the developer. I think it'll be a good development there. I think it's a win for the subdivision. I truly think that this is good for everybody. But if there's something, and if any of you come to me that I can do on my end to be able to help this, like I truly care about this woman, whatever time that I've got to put in to be able to help her, I'm willing to do. That's all I got, thanks. Thank you. Anybody else speaking in support? Okay, uh, those speaking in opposition. Good evening, commissioners. Um, my name is Gordon Stacy Harmon. I reside, like I did a few minutes ago, at 1826 Joy Circle. Um, I don't need to tell you that RM20's zoning is going to allow for short-term rentals. I just ask you to refer back to the previous case. Um, but it's a huge concern for many residents in the neighborhood, both in Highland Heights as well as Cleveland Park. As we've seen an increase in housing stock being turned into these short-term rentals, again, as we referenced in the last case. If our need in this city is so great for housing, we should not be building units originally presented at housing that then turn into de facto hotels. Even if the potential developer and or builder have no intention of representing or selling the units as investment properties with the usage as short-term rentals, the entitlements of the zoning would allow any future owner to permit his or her unit as such. The proliferation of short-term rental properties in our city has contributed to the deterioration of neighborhoods historically considered as communities desirable to both current and future residents. While our leadership grapples with ways to, to limit and curb STRs, we see more and more of our valuable housing stock being converted to this type of usage. With an incredible strain on housing inventory, a city cannot afford to be convinced that greater density will automatically equate to housing inventory only to have said inventory become commercial enterprises that are occupied only for a few days a week or month by people who are only visiting and will not be long-term contributors to our neighborhood. As often stated, I do not oppose additional housing stock in a neighborhood if and only if it's responsible development and managed growth. I don't object to this particular owner reaping a financial windfall from the property. However, as neighbors, the neighborhood itself would have no recourse to prevent or prohibit usage of one or more short-term rentals on this particular property. I would like to see the intended site plan be ensured the STR usage is, percent, uh, is, is prohibited. So I would ask the, the commission to please either deny the zoning or ask for um, an agreement to stay within SP zoning. Thank you. Thank you. you. Anyone else speaking in opposition? Hi there, I'm Amanda Widener. I live at 1231 Joseph Avenue. I'm just across the way and two doors down from this property. I've been, lived in the neighborhood since 2006 as well um, in this property for almost 10 years. And I don't have a problem with the density. I mean, the owner should be able to sell her her property and you know I, I agree that we need more density in the neighborhood and this lot can it can serve that but i do have a problem with the rm20a this is the only lot in the whole area that would be zoned that um, there is a development right across the way it's all sp it's all owners that live there full time so my objection is just the ability to expose the rest of the neighborhood especially our residential streets um, to hoteling i mean that's my only objection um, it's a family oriented neighborhood again not opposed to the the density just the potential hoteling that's it thank you Hello, I'm Tara Jerkirk. I live at 1232 Joseph Avenue, the property directly next to it. I have a really close relationship with Miss um, Doris and her daughter back there, as well as their late son or their late husband, Mr. Ronnie. Um, I I agree with what everybody else has said here. I I know that the, this is going to be more dense, and I'm okay with that. I'm just more opposed to the rezoning of RM20. Um, my whole lot is going to be backed by three or four Airbnbs, essentially, um, looking into my whole property. So, 
Um, I, otherwise, I agree with everybody else sit here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ashanti Davis, 321 Edwin Street, Nashville. Y'all know where I live. Um, I actually, um, I would like to point out that this is a higher zoning change on a smaller lot than the last one you just heard. And I actually feel super sympathetic for, to you all. Like, you all are so thoughtful, and I immensely appreciate that. And as someone who's lived in this neighborhood my entire life, like, we live in that tension of this development and also like, you know, pers uh, to preserve it and then also to grow it. So I'm not against density, and I do recognize that the applicant is very sympathetic. But the first time I appeared before you all was May 11th, 2017. It is my late father's birthday. And my mother came asking for you guys to waive something that staff approved. And she's a widow, she's on disability, and you guys didn't give us what we wanted. And that was hard, but it was okay, because I understand that this is bigger than my family's problem, and bigger than my family's life. Not that that problem isn't hard and that I'm not sympathetic, but it's we're balancing more than just one neighbor's needs. This is a community and that everyone's property rights are impacted if RM20 happens when RS5 is all around it. And I recognize that they're close to Dickerson, I'm close to Dickerson, but Dickerson is a corridor and then right behind it is a bunch of single family neighborhoods. And so I appreciate how thoughtful you, are, you all are. I am sympathetic to the discussion that you guys are about to have, but I would say that the reason why you guys did a charrette, which I appreciate the fact that y'all did that, is because there was a land use policy change without public notice, without all the, the rigmarole. We didn't go through that at first, and that's why you guys graciously gave that to us. And so I just want to say thank you for your time. Thank you for listening, and I'll leave the last 11 seconds. Thank y'all. Thank you. Anybody else speaking in opposition? Councilman, do you want your... I guess we don't give you even two minutes, but do you want the time for a rebuttal? We all know, can you hear me? I'm consistent, okay? Even neighbors who disagree with me 90% of the time, you know, just like uh, my wonderful, intelligent, dynamic speaking, intelligent neighbor just said, they had a case in front of you. I came and supported them just like I do every neighbor because everybody deserves the same chance. And you denied it just like you denied the other case I support. I still love you all because we can agree to disagree and be cordial. And that's just who I am. I want everybody to prosper, you know, there's neighbors that have vacant land. I want them to stay in the neighborhood. I want their parents to stay in the neighborhood. I want their kids. So I'm like, let's do the density so everybody can stay. And I know that may be the old hippie in me, okay? But I'm gonna be consistent in how I feel. I'll try my best. And so I'm just asking you to follow the policy, which once again, my wonderful neighbors, we did a public note, we did this extra charrette. We did all this stuff. And then because there may be a use that some people may not like. Why do we deviate? I mean, it's up to you. You, no matter how you go, we're gonna, we're going. We'll, we'll still be friends, and we'll still, we'll still be great, and we're gonna be okay. But I just need to understand, like, okay, do we need to go down to Douglas and do all RM20 now, and just say RM20 but no STRPs? I'm, I might be okay with that. You know, I just need to know how so I can come up here and bring an easy case in front of you. And, 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 and you know, and, 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 you know, Commissioner Farr, I really respect your opinion. And so I'm really, I'm, I was listening. I'm, you know, maybe I'll bring that back just so we can get some clarification. Maybe we can do RM40 and just say no STRPs. I mean, down the whole corridor, you know, or something. But I want you to support this change because you know, no matter what happens with the commissioners, I have to find a way to help my constituent have a better life. And I'm always going to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I will declare the public hearing closed. And uh, Councilman, I think I'll start with you.
<laughs> oh, this councilman. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> it's an interesting case. Usually, uh, we're never being asked to transfer wealth from the city equity to to a private citizen uh, to support that person. Uh, so I never heard that argument made before, but uh, I think we do that downtown. We gave uh, incentives to Bridgestone, to many corporations. So why wouldn't we want to incentivize also uh, one of the people in the city that that has been paying taxes and needs help? So, I mean, although it's a, it's a, it's a new type of an argument to discuss uh, a zoning issue, uh, I mean, I heard it before for big corporations, so I'm, uh, I'm going to listen to this as well. Uh, obviously, the, the argument should really not be about money, it should be about uh, is zoning, is, is that an appropriate uh, density for that corridor? Does it meet the policy? It is a, um, an appropriate use of that site. And uh, <clears throat> At a personal level, also, is it a loophole around the effort we did to try to stop uh, short-term rentals? And so I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, so uh, I will be inclined to agree with the density question, but I cannot agree with the, with the short-term rental uh, uh, opening door or back door to, to that issue. Many of my peers in the council work really hard to try to come up with some kind of a compromise, and, and that's the compromise we got. So I wouldn't want to undermine the effort uh, that took many months, uh, hundreds of hours of people trying to figure out how to do it right. But I also don't want to penalize uh, uh, something that uh, seems to meet the policy and the objective. So, uh, I'm hoping that the council member or the or the person that is submitting this request will agree uh, to do a deferral and come back with something that can do both, right? Can uh, address the issue of stopping uh, the ability to have a short-term rental while uh, increasing the equity and the entitlements on that side. So. Thank you, Commissioner Bichelle? Um I. I feel like we are paralyzed and uh, by our strange fear of short-term rentals. And even though we have great analysis and recommendation by staff, if you look at this street, if you go down this street, you can see that, that this is a good place to have multifamily. But we're so scared that somebody might use it as a short-term rental. We are going to limit the housing stock. That's how we're gonna limit the housing stock not because they're gonna turn into short-term rentals, but because we're going to limit the ability to make multifamilies because we're scared they're gonna turn into short-term rentals. So I, I'm gonna vote consistently with what I voted on the previous case, which is to agree with staff. Commissioner Blackshear. Um, I do think this is a little different than the case that we previously saw. The, the previous case had a lot that was way more embedded in the SPR, which was really RS5 with the, um, with the DADU allotment. Here, it is literally on a corner that um, is facing commercial. Um, and so it is, to the, um, the owner's point, the, the placement on the corner does differentiate it to me um, from the um, from the case that we just heard. So um, I am still thinking, and I would love to hear other commissioners' thoughts. But to me, this does not seem as offensive as rezoning one lot that was pretty well embedded in a in a practically an RS5 neighborhood. Thank you, Commissioner Tibbs. Yeah, I, I think um, Dr. Michelle kind of expressed my sentiments as well, um, and I have a lot of uh, consternation about uh, STRPs. However, you know, that was last year. We battled through it, and, you know, there's some council worked very hard to come up with it. 
So now, you know, we, we've got our tools and um, kind of like the last one, but even more so this one, I think it is very uh, concurrent with policy and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's right at a corner. So even regardless of the, you know, the uh, story of the owner, I just, and, and I, you know, I, I understand the apprehension about what it could be, but truthfully, this is, to me, this fits well, policy and where it, uh, where the location is even stronger. So I um, support the analysis and um, staff recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner Moore. Um, I agree with Commissioner Blackshear. Um, initially, looking at this, I didn't feel as worried about it. I think because it does back up to the uh, community center policy. Um, I think it's an appropriate place for a uh, transition and more density there. Again, I think if it was in the middle of a neighborhood similar to the other one, I would, you know, vote differently. But um, I'll listen to our last two here. Commissioner Novel? Uh, I agree with Commissioner Bichelle. Commissioner Sims? I know it's hard for you to listen to me. So. Mm. Um, I don't want to be so dismissive of the short-term rental conversation because I live in a neighborhood that has been devastated by them. And we are actually don't have enough people to keep our school open. We don't have enough people to join our neighborhood associate. All the things that ultimately the very core principle of Nashville Next is that we will enhance neighborhoods. So the decision that we make that ultimately we can't make because we don't have the tools, and we did argue about it last year, is outside of our, I mean, I, I don't know how to fight that any more than we did. Um, and so I want to just affirm our neighbors who are concerned that, and I am deathly afraid because I've experienced it, of neighborhoods turning into short-term rentals. And many of you live in more protected neighborhoods, but for those of us who don't, it's a serious problem. Having said that, I actually did go by and look at this property. I looked at it very carefully because this one really got to me. The other one was less so because it was in the middle of a neighborhood. This area really needs something. And as empathetic as I am to the individual, and I like your argument. I liked where you were going, Councilman. Um, the individual, um, you know, the Financial concerns are something that's not embedded in our policies yet. I wish they were, but they're not. And so I actually think this is a really good use of this corner. I think it sets a precedent that would, that this the whole back of this unit will, I mean, the whole thing needs fixing right here. Um, so contrary to the other case, which was just like it, I actually do like what's going on here. I am concerned about the REM status. I wish we could do something else um, that allowed for more density, but I don't know what that is. So all that's to say I do, I, I think I'm going to approve what the staff wants. So. so any other discussion? I guess I should state for the record since I made the motion on the last one that um, I agree with the analysis of Commissioner Blackshear again that this is, being adjacent to um, a commercial corridor, I, I definitely do see this as a, a different um, setting than the last one that we looked at. But any further discussion or is someone ready yeah. to make a motion? I would like to encourage the councilman. Did he step yeah. out? Oh, well, he can watch this on TV later on. Um, I would like to encourage him to do what he suggested that he might do, which is to come back with some uh, idea about Douglas Avenue. This was not in the Highland Heights neighborhood plan, this particular stretch. And um, so I, I'm glad you're back, Councilman, because I was actually talking right to you. Um, I was gonna say that um, even though I'm supporting staff recommendations on this, I'd still like to encourage you to do what you had suggested and maybe come back with um, uh, an idea for what you could do along Douglas um, in the future to encourage multifamily but limit short-term rentals and so that we don't have to do this piece by piece by piece in the future. But I am supporting staff recommendations on that. Douglas is difficult because we have industrial along Douglas. We have multifamily along Douglas. 
we have apartments, gas stations. It's a commercial street, you know? And unfortunately, long time ago, before any of us were born, you know, they put a, they put a highway between there, they added commercial, they added businesses that create smoke, you know, heavy industrial on Douglas. You know, certain parts more, certain parts less. So at times, you know, to me and to some of my neighbors, it's better to have residential or some kind of commercial. But if we start rezoning for commercial, then we get into the whole, someone could turn this into an Airbnb again. With the industrial zone, someone could turn the already current parcel zone industrial, Airbnb. I mean, it's, like you said, I'm not a, I'm tired of being afraid of tourists. You know, I understand the concerns. Maybe we looked at putting a security guard and restricting things, but you know, I gotta convince, you know, maybe 36 or 37 other of my brothers and sisters. And no, and the battle is hard. We fought it last year, and, and, and all of you are saints for putting up with that. But the policy is what it is. We went through this whole change. Please support the policy. I'm asking. Okay, so. Anyone prepared to make a motion? I make a motion that we uh, approve um, 108 Douglas Avenue uh, with staff recommendations. Second. Okay, we have a proper motion and second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? One opposed. Okay, motion carries. Um, I think that adjourns our, our the primary part of our agenda. Um, where are we? Historic. Historic. <laughs> Any oh, updates? No, no report. And then Parks has left. Executive committee, I don't think there's much except for the, our work session, our tour of the planning department that we have a week from next Tuesday, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, and then executive director and your moment to introduce our new planner. Okay, well, um, thank you. Um, I, many of you met him back in the, uh, rec room back there, kitchen. Um, but I'd like to welcome Joran Donovan. Lisa, did I pronounce that? Joran, did I? Hi, welcome. Um, so Joran is originally from Virginia Beach, Virginia, and is very passionate about planning. And we're so excited to have him. He's joining the land development section. So at some point, maybe the next meeting, if you're lucky, we'll be joining it. We'll be giving us a presentation on some really difficult project. <laughs> and we look forward to it. No, I'm kidding. Welcome. And uh, we're so happy to have you here with us. And that's my, and we're, we are very excited about the, um, work session with all of you. So. Any other updates? We're good? I think we're good. Motion to adjourn. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.